um, uh, Professor and Vice Dean of Humanities Peter Mankel, uh, who is with us this morning, sort of representing the Dornsife Administration, the University Administration, to give a few words of welcome. So um, I'd like to turn the podium briefly over to Dean Mankel. Thanks, Laurie. Uh, though we had nothing to do about it, the Office of the Dorn Safe Dean apologizes for your food not being here. It's, it's bad enough going into a crowd, and then you know, a hungry crowd is not, near, not nearly as fun. Anyway, I, um, I was really delighted that Laurie uh, invited me to come uh, to give you a very brief welcome here uh, this morning. I'm a professor of history. I, do, I study 16th century American history. Uh, and I've been in this job as Vice Dean of the Humanities for three years. And one of the really great things, actually the greatest thing about being in this job is learning about the rich work that the community of humanists at USC is doing. There are 350 members of the faculty in the, in the humanities division across all, all sorts of fields. And before I took this job, I knew very little about a lot of them. And so I get to read a lot and I get to meet a lot, including meeting with really some of my favorite chairs, of whom Lori knows. You know, she is one. And one of the really great things for me personally, uh, as we've had conversations with the Farang Foundation over the couple of years, is to learn about the unbelievable, rich, and sophisticated work being done in Iranian studies, uh, and Iranian American studies, and diasporic <laughs> studies. And it's just so exciting. And I so wish that I could be here with you today. It's a fabulous program. And I've got to tell you, uh, this presentation this afternoon from Karosh is going to be amazing. This poster is such a work of art. I would urge you to look at it very carefully. There's a whole dynamic thing that's going on there. Anyway, I told Lori I would be very brief. I'm going to turn it over to her to talk about the substance of the conference. Again, on behalf of the office of the dean of USC Dornsife, I welcome you to USC. I hope you have a wonderful day. I look forward to hearing more about the program afterwards. Thank you very much. I want to thank Peter for coming. He has to run now straight up to Pasadena where he has a, an event and then he has to come back to campus this afternoon for another event. So the life of a dean, uh, the jobs, the, the presentations and the appearances don't seem to end. Um, yeah, so good morning again. I am Laurie Brand. I'm the uh, director of the Middle East Studies program here uh, in the Dornsife College at USC. And um, I just want to begin by echoing um, Peter's words of welcome to all of you, those of you who are students, those of you who are uh, faculty, our colleagues who have come from uh, far away, our colleagues from the Farhang Foundation, um, and also members of the broader community who are here. You're all very welcome. We're excited to have such a diverse group of people come to this uh, program today. I want to begin by saying that this conference is a product of a partnership between USC, Dornsife, and Dornsife is the name of our, of our college, uh, through the Middle East Studies Program and the Farhang Foundation. Uh, this partnership between USC, Dornsife, and Farhang is still relatively young, uh, but it's really witnessed exciting developments since its inception. Just to name uh, the most prominent of them, the hiring of faculty off for Persian language, and our Persian language instructor is Dr. Peyman Nujumian back there. Um, and then the following year, hiring a professor in Persian history and culture, and that's Professor Hani Khafipur, who's here chairing the first panel. Uh, then three, three semesters ago, initiating the first minor in Iranian studies, uh, in the first, uh, that was the first uh, in USC's history. Uh, the initiation this past fall of what will be an annual uh, distinguished lecture in Iranian studies series. Uh, and we hosted Professor Rudy Mate from the University of Delaware. Uh, and now this conference on culture and diaspora. So it seemed to me fitting that this inaugural conference as part of this partnership with Farhang be held just following Nowruz, the Iranian New Year, as part of launching, I think, a new stage, uh, a new year in our Iranian studies initiative. Now, we don't have a keynote address for today, and that was really by design. Um, instead, we opted to feature in our day's program some examples of culture and diaspora. So if you've looked carefully at the program, you know that we are going to, at, at, our, uh, at our luncheon break, uh, instead of having a keynote address, we're going to take a pause with some humor uh, with a prominent uh, Iranian-American com comedian. And then following dinner, we will have a classical Persian music ensemble. 
So I hope that those will, uh, both of those events will enrich your day uh, in, in, in various ways. I think we have plenty of intellectual content being presented by our wonderful panelists this morning and this afternoon. So I hope you don't feel deprived of a, of a keynote address. Let me, however, just spend a few minutes on setting the stage thematically or conceptually for the presentations for discussion. Uh, as many of you may know, scholarly treatments of the concept of diaspora often begin with uh, by noting the Greek origins of the term from two words meaning to, to sow, as in the word to sow seed, and then the word for over or around. So there is then this implicit meaning of something which is spread widely or across a wide area. And for the ancient Greeks, this spreading or sowing was not just migration of people, but also colonization. Uh, they established city-states and trading colonies around the Mediterranean region. But as the term diaspora evolved, uh, at least in terms of its common use in English, uh, at least before there was this, we have had a major wave of diaspora studies more recently, and that's um, something that I'll talk about in a moment. But its common term in English for a long time was to refer to a small number of experiences of expulsion, forced displacement, and or trauma of groups of people uh, in what we generally call nations or ethno-nations. And the most notable or most frequently cited examples of diaspora in this traditional literature were the Jewish, Armenian, African, and Palestinian diasporas. But in the last several decades, the scholarly literature that has examined the concept of diaspora has begun to be intertwined or overlap with questions related to migration, immigrant integration, changing notions of national identity, citizenship, and multiculturalism. So the writings on the concept have grown dramatically, uh, and the literature, I think, is as rich as it is varied. So just to give some examples. First, the concept of a diaspora itself, what constitutes a diaspora, has evolved well away from those that are triggered by trauma, by an initial trauma or successive traumas. So indeed, some scholars, in their attempt to try and theorize about the evolution of diasporas and the potential role of diasporas, um, scholars have tried to categorize them according to their origins or their, their, their initial functions. So people have talked about imperial diasporas, about commerce or trading diasporas, labor diasporas, and so on. And with this, this expansion in the number of cases uh, that, in effect, qualify for the designation of diaspora, we now have studies of diasporas of perhaps, perhaps a majority of people, but certainly a large, large number of peoples or um, ethno-national groups around the world. Now, in addition, the types of investigations or studies that have been undertaken cross disciplines as well as levels of analysis. So that one finds micro-level ethnographies of individual or small community experiences out of a larger diaspora. One finds more meso-level or middle-level studies of the economic and political relationships between sending states and their immigrants or of relationships between receiving states and societies with communities whose origins are outside their national territories as well as macro-level studies of a broad history of a diaspora or of the role of diasporas as actors in international politics, broadly defined. Now, as some analysts have noted, many studies sort of take for granted um, or begin with the assumption that all people originally from country X or society X, um, although how recently is sometimes an issue, but anyway, that all of these people are by definition members of the X, Xian diaspora. So at this juncture, I think, since the United States is a classic example of a country of immigration, and I, since I assume we have in the audience at least some people who think of them in hyphenated, think of themselves in hyphenated terms, um, I'm wondering if I'd like you all to sort of reflect, begin now and then think as we go through the day, on whether you've posed the question of whether you also define yourself as a member of a diaspora or perhaps more than one diaspora, depending on the origins of your parents. Some of us have parents of you know, mixed ancestry. Uh, and if you do think of yourself as a member of a diaspora, what does that diaspora identity mean to you? Uh, how do you live or practice it? Is it language? Is it food? Is it music? Is it religion? Um, and on what levels or in which spheres of your life is it salient? Family, community, civic associations, religious associations? Whatever your answer is and whatever your previous notion of or your engagement with the concept or constitution of a diaspora may be, I hope that today's program will not only add to your appreciation of Iranian culture and diaspora, but also stimulate your interest and perhaps uh, enable you to open up new horizons or open up to new understandings of the importance of this term diaspora in its varied manifestations and its relationship to a range of cultural forms. 
So in this program, we have intentionally sought to bring together the socio-political and the cultural as they relate to diasporas. We do so taking as our focus the case of the rich interrelationships of Iran, the Iranian diaspora, and Iranian culture. And we're very pleased to have such a distinguished group of scholars, our panelists, whose expertise spans the social science disciplines of sociology and anthropology, and the humanities areas of literature, cinema, and art. So in closing, let me thank again the Farhang Foundation for their generous support. I'd also like to say to thank USC Dornsife College, our colleagues from near and far who accepted our invitations to join us as panelists, my colleagues in the Middle East Studies program who were key in formulating the ideas and, and, and choosing the people to attend this conference, in particular, Professor Hani uh, Khafipour and Peyman Nujumyan. I want to thank my stellar uh, uh, Middle East program assistant, uh, who bears no responsibility for the fact that your breakfast did not show up this morning. Uh, her name is Camelia Shofani. Some of you have been in touch with her. I want to thank the student volunteers. And then, most of all, I want to thank you for your interest and participation. So um, at this point, is the food there? OK, great. Alhamdulillah. So <laughs> what I'd like to do then is we'll, we, we'll switch this a little bit. I want to give you the opportunity to go and get some coffee, get some breakfast. Um, please don't tarry because we want to get started with the panel as soon as possible. But please take a few minutes, get something to eat, come back. You're welcome to bring it back in this room. That's not a problem. Uh, and then we will. Uh, then I will turn the, the floor over to uh, our moderator for the, the panel. So please help yourselves and let's reconvene in maybe about five minutes, maximum ten minutes. Thank you. Good to have you guys here. My name is Hani Kafipur. I'm a faculty member at Middle East Studies program here at USC. Um, first of all, I would like to thank the director of Middle East Studies, Professor Lori Brand, for not only organize, helping organize this uh, conference, but all her hard work in organizing various uh, events for Middle East Studies program. Can we have a round of applause for her? She's been working so hard. I would also like to thank uh, our assistant, uh, program assistant, Camelia Shofani, and uh, Payman, Professor Payman Nujumian, and Ramzi Rogui, who's not with us right now. They helped really plan and organize this, this event. Um, I would also like to thank the Farhang Foundation uh, for their continuous support of Iranian studies at the University of Southern California here, especially Hale and Ahmad and Rani. Before we get started, I would like to take a few minutes and introduce our esteemed panelists. Our first speaker, Dr. Malik, sitting here, uh, is a lecturer in anthropology at UCLA, where she received her PhD uh, in 2015. Uh, we are very happy to have you with us. In general, her research interests include migration, diaspora, and visual culture, with a focus on Iranian communities in North America and Europe, Dr. Malik's most recent research examines the relationship between cultural policy and practice among diasporic Iranian communities in Sweden and Canada, with particular attention given to the influences of multiculturalism on cultural productions. Today, she will be discussing a global perspective that traces trends in Iranian immigration beyond the U.S. context, namely in the Iranian diaspora in Stockholm and Toronto and she examines the impact of state policies on diasporic cultural production. The, talk, the title of her talk is Iranians in Diaspora, a Global Perspective. It's a pleasure to have you with us. Our next speaker, Dr. Neda Mahvuleh, sitting over there, is an assistant professor and member of graduate faculty in the Department of Sociology at University of Toronto. Her research has been funded by the National Science Foundation, American Sociological Association, and National Women's Studies Association. And alongside scholarly articles and books, she also writes for the general public in venues like the Toronto Star and Salon.com. Her most recent publication is a book titled The Limits of Whiteness by Stanford University Press. Her talk today, titled Iranian Americans and Everyday Politics of Race, uh, in it, Dr. Marboulet argues that it is time to ask what the Iranian case tells us about race in America. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you in there. 
Our final speaker for this morning panel is Dr. Mehdi Bozorgmer, in, sitting over there. He's a professor of sociology at the Graduate Center and City College, City University of New York. He was the founding co-director of the Middle East and Middle Eastern American Center at the Graduate Center from 2001 to 2013. He has been conducting research on Iranian American since the late 1980s and has published numerous articles and books, book chapters on the topic. His most recent publication on Iranian Americans include a very interesting type article, The Persian Paradox, Language Use and Preference Among Iranian Americans. And that article appears in the Journal of Sociology and Language. And, uh, and the most recent uh, book chapter in the forthcoming book titled Iranian Studies in America, Looking Back, Looking Ahead. Dr. Bozorgmer's talk is titled Comparing the Progress of the First and Second Generation Iranian Americans by drawing upon a variety of government census and community surveys. Dr. Bozorgmer examines the main demographic and socioeconomic characteristics of the second generations and compares them with those of the first generation of Iranian Americans. We are honored to have you with us. Thank you so much. Uh, after the panel, we'll have uh, a few moments for question and answer session, and we look forward to your questions or comments that you may have. Uh, so without further ado, I uh, invite Amy to come and give us a talk. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, honey. Thank you to Laurie Brand and all your colleagues for organizing such a wonderful event for us today. Um, and thank you for inviting me to join you in uh, a Bruin on Trojan territory. I appreciate your warmth and kindness and not attacking. <laughs> Um, so, as an anthropologist, uh, I'm interested in cultural production in diasporic contexts and also in examining diaspora as a category of practice. So, Professor Brand gave us a nice um, history of the term diaspora and how it's been used. And one of the ways that uh, scholars have kind of adjusted the philosophical take on diaspora is to consider it as a category of practice. How are people using this term to do things in the world? Um, so that's kind of my approach to the study of diaspora more generally. Um, so today I'll be speaking about some of my work in Sweden. Uh, in the interest of time, I probably won't speak about Toronto, but I'm very happy to talk about that in Q&A and as the day goes forward in our interactions. So um, before I do that, I'd like to start um, just by giving a, a brief overview of the Iranian diaspora from a global perspective. <clears throat> so uh, Iranians who migrated in the last 40 years, so accepting the, the Parsis in India and several other migratory periods that we've, we have had in history, um, in the last 40 years, Iranians have scattered to nearly every continent, comprising a global diaspora estimated between 4 and 6 million. They've tended to concentrate in several key urban centers, uh, which we might call diaspora cities following Jenny, following Jenny Berman, and which we might tend to be associated with the capitals of the Iranian diaspora. These might include Los Angeles, of course, uh, Toronto, London, Hamburg, Stockholm, Dubai, Kuala Lumpur, uh, and Sydney. That's not an exhaustive list, of course, but we have very strong communities in these cities. Uh, yet, as uh, French scholar Nader Valhavi has shown, uh, the part of the world with the most Iranian residents outside of Iran is likely neither North America nor Europe. According to his estimates, and perhaps unsurprisingly when we, we think about it, Iran's geographic neighbors are home to the majority of Iranians outside of Iran. Countries uh, like the UAE, Qatar, Bahrain, Turkey, Kuwait, excuse me, um, Iraq, Pakistan, Afghanistan, and others. Some also tend to forget Israel, the large number of Baha'is and Jews who live in that country as well. So beyond these population centers in Southwest Asia, North America, in Europe, Iranians also live in South Africa, in Brazil, in Peru, in India, New Zealand, Japan, and other points in between. I'm trying to give you a sense of how global <laughs> this diaspora really is. <clears throat> It's perhaps testament to both the breadth of the Iranian diaspora and the global growth of cosmopolitan tastes that Google can now recommend Persian restaurants to us beyond the capitals of LA, DC, or Kuala Lumpur. So you can enjoy your kubide <laughs> in Shanghai, in Manila, in Barcelona, and in Havana. Okay, 
I'm glad you have food. I was worried that this would become a very <laughs> hungry moment as we talked about our kebab. Okay. So uh, population statistics in Iran's uh, neighboring countries are difficult to acquire. And demographic studies have been complicated by several factors, like inadequate counts, the continued migration of undocumented Iranians, and the challenge of how to count second and third generation members of the diaspora, the children and grandchildren of Iranian immigrants. Even in countries like Sweden, known for its very comprehensive statistics and the counts of its population, <clears throat> with increasing outmarriage, the second generation and, and, and now the third generation are becoming increasingly difficult to count, as are those undocumented Iranians that make any comprehensive statistics um, unreliable. So given often political and economic motivation for migration, many diasporic Iranians are, not, are either unable or disinclined to live in the Islamic Republic of Iran. So there has been a recent trend of, of return migration, both among young second generation Iranians in diaspora and more recent immigrants from Iran. And this could be inspired in part by the perceived potential of the Rouhani administration, and now we have some uh, progress in nuclear talks as well. But regardless of whether Iranians in diaspora travel to Iran regularly, and there are many who do, uh, strong connections to Iran and Iranians are often maintained across generations and across borders as the poles of cultural nostalgia and continued social networks with family and friends in Iran and in diaspora are often reinforced and productive, or re reinforced by and are productive of cultural products, particularly in these large population centers of the Iranian diaspora. Despite this notable global breadth, with large populations of Iranians in multiple countries, and continents. Social scientific studies of the Iranian diaspora have tended to focus primarily on the large communities in the United States. Building on the excellent work done by pioneers in the social scientific study of the Iranian diaspora, such as Mehdi Bozorgmer, Hamid Nafisi, and others, given the breadth of diaspora and the continuing migration of Iranians to global destinations, there are exciting new directions for scholarship of the Iranian diaspora in these non-US locations and on the connections and comparison between these diasporic cities. My own research contributes to this effort. In the manuscript I'm currently developing, I offer a multi-sided ethnographic study of the Iranian diaspora, and particularly looking at cultural production in Toronto, Stockholm, and Los Angeles. I do this to examine and compare what impact multiculturalism policies have had on diasporic citizenship and understandings of culture. In the interest of time, today I'm going to focus on the Stockholm case, though I'm happy to discuss Toronto later. So first, <clears throat> I'll offer a brief overview of Iranian immigration to Sweden and a sense of the European immigration context. Then I'll present an example from my ethnographic fieldwork to make two arguments regarding the unexpected impacts of cultural policy on Iranian immigrant practice. <clears throat> Although Sweden had experienced small-scale immigration from neighboring countries like, Swe like Finland for centuries, the first major migrations to Sweden didn't begin until labor migration in the 1950s and 1960s when immigration reform limited labor migration from outside the Nordic region in 1972. Over the next 17 years, Swedish immigration shifted from mostly white, Christian, European labor migrants to humanitarian asylum seekers and their family members from Uganda, Chile, Argentina, Turkey, Iran, and Iraq. This meant an increase in non-European immigrants from less than 10% in the period of 1945 to 1972 to an average of 40% in the following decades that it's accepting this large number of migrants from the Balkans in the 1990s. And so in this chart, you see the orange line right around 1990s when you start seeing more uh, refugees from the Balkans. So in a very short time, the ethnic, racial, and class composition of the Swedish population changed significantly. And that's a reality that has had important impacts on immigrant integration and the approach of multiculturalism in Sweden. Significant numbers of Iranians began to arrive in Sweden in the 1980s. It's peaking in 1986 primarily as asylum seekers fleeing the 1979 revolution and subsequent Iran-Iraq war. These refugees were often politically active, secular, and opponents of the Islamic uh, Republic. Later, between 2000 and 2011, Iranians accounted for 3% of all immigrants to Sweden, coming as refugees, but also as students and job seekers. As in other parts of the Iranian diaspora, and unlike some other refugee communities, Iranians arriving in Sweden brought with them a relative abundance of social and cultural capital. Iranian refugees of Sweden were largely from Iran's educated middle class, 
and remain one of the most highly educated immigrant groups in Sweden, where more than 25% of both men and women have attained at least three years of post-secondary education. That's 6% higher than the Swedish average. Yet, only 54.4% of Iranians in Sweden were employed in 2011, well below the rate of non-immigrant Swedes, which is a trend that's common among immigrant groups in Sweden. Indeed, Sweden has the highest unemployment gap between immigrants and non-immigrants among all Nordic countries. Perhaps due in part to their social, political, and cultural activities in Iran prior to migration, Iranian communities in Sweden are quite active in both political and cultural realms. Iranians are members of Swedish political parties. They hold municipal positions and have served in Swedish parliament. Several Iranian Swedes now serve on arts councils. They participate in organizations that determine funding of city and cultural programming. And they appear with increasing frequency in the cast of popular Swedish TV shows and on the uh, Stockholm's prestigious <coughs> theater stages. As of 2013, a full 21% of Sweden's population was either foreign-born or born in, in Sweden to at least one foreign-born parent. That's 21% of the population. Considering that immigration began in the 50s and 60s, you can see how quickly the population have, has shifted. There are currently over 97,000 individuals of Iranian heritage registered as living in Sweden. That's nearly 5% of the total foreign, born, uh, foreign background population, which includes the second generation, and 1% of the total Swedish population of 9.6 million. Although Iranian uh, immigrants are spread around the country, they're most uh, concentrated in Stockholm County, which includes the city of Stockholm, where I did my research. In recent years, Europe has experienced a sharp rise in nativist sentiments and anti-immigration activism, where growing popular movements have protested not only immigration, but the presence of Middle Eastern and Muslim immigrants in particular. The recent rise of UKIP in the United Kingdom, increasing support for Marine Le Pen's National Front in France, and the emergence of the Pegida movement in Germany, each suggest an intensifying antagonism against immigrants and a dissatisfaction with what is perceived to be their government's approach to immigrant integration. Even in countries like Sweden, with its reputation as a progressive liberal democracy with an open door approach to refugees and asylum, the Sweden Democrats, a far right anti immigrant party, won parliament seats in 2010 and again in 2014, making it the third largest party in Swedish parliament today. So these are some of the um, early uh, promotional uh, ads that the Sweden Democrats use. You can see they're, they're very xenophobic in nature, keep Sweden Swedish, a multicultural Sweden, no thanks in front of an image of a mosque. They didn't get as much support this way. They recently um, changed their branded image to this. Uh, so Swedish Democrats, security and tradition. <laughs> Their policy interests, their xenophobic nature is the same, but they have couched it in a much more friendly term, and they have gained uh, many more votes that way, so third largest party in parliament. So in each of these countries, in Germany, in France, uh, in Sweden, in the UK, incidents like rioting or acts of terrorism routinely have been blamed on multiculturalism. For example, in 2013, when riots shook 18 of Stockholm's immigrant suburbs, populated largely by Middle Eastern and African immigrants, including Iranians, journalists quickly drew comparisons to the riots that took place in London and Paris, as you can see in this cartoon. Swedish politicians and local journalists also fired off accusations of blame towards their favorite whipping boy. They said, Swedish multiculturalism goes awry, multiculturalism is failing, and even Sweden's problem is not Islam, it's multiculturalism. In these contexts, multiculturalism is viewed as the state's response to immigration, making these critiques rooted fundamentally in ideas about culture. The term multiculturalism can simultaneously refer to an ideology, a set of policies, and a demographic reality. It means different things to different people in different places and times. That said, its policies usually require that governments give immigrant communities, national minorities, and indigenous groups equal protection under the law. Critiques of multiculturalism have been leveled from all sides, as much from politicians and journalists as from scholars and policymakers. While the political right has argued that multiculturalism encourages the development of isolated, self-segregated, parallel societies, the political left has claimed that multiculturalism encourages the essentialization of cultural groups, celebrating difference while ultimately maintaining structural inequalities. According to its critics, these minorities become separate but equal, living in isolated communities, maintaining traditional ways of life and preferences, and in the case of immigrants, actively resisting assimilation or integration. Understandings of culture and the role of belonging have been at the heart of these debates. 
And there are many more angles of critique, but in all of these different approaches, one feature of multiculturalism is consistently maligned by virtually all critics. That's the ethnic festival. Vilified as shallow, pandering, and feel good in their celebrations of what one caller called the three S's, that's sorry, samosas, and steel drums. Festivals showcasing ethnic diversity in multicultural states are perhaps the one thing all critics love to hate. Anti-essentialist critics have argued that multicultural policies create cultural straitjackets that serve to police cultural practices like those that appear in these festivals. As Ann Phillips has put it, these policies, quote, force those described as members of a minority cultural group into a regime of authenticity, denying them the chance to cross cultural borders, borrow cultural influences, or define and redefine themselves, end quote. Festivals are viewed as events that put this regime of authenticity on stage, and that enabling the liberal majority to feel good about their tolerant cosmopolitan lifestyles while consuming shallow representations of essentialized culture, all the while ignoring those real problems of immigrants, like unemployment, education, and access to state resources. While I'm sympathetic to anti-essentialism, rather than dismiss these festivals as guilty of perpetuating all those sins attributed to multiculturalism, I studied several large Iranian cultural festivals seeking not the redemption of the genre, but rather questioning its enduring attraction by examining what lasting impacts they may have, if any, beyond the festival grounds. Are these events really only a state-supported venue for cosmopolitan consumption of a sterilized third world culture? Or are there unexamined long-term consequences not only for artists and cosmopolitan audiences, but for Iranian communities and their participation in their multicultural societies? Elfesten, Swedish for Fire Festival, is an annual celebration held in a number of Swedish cities on the last Tuesday evening of the Iranian solar year, six days before the new year. This celebration, funded almost entirely by the Swedish Arts Council through the National Touring Theater of Sweden, draws over 20,000 people to the center of Stockholm in March in the snow, let me remind you, uh, to celebrate what is known by Iranians as Chahar Shambhasuri. In its celebration as Eldfesten, the event includes musical performances, dance performances, fire jumping and fireworks, and is advertised in both Swedish and Persian languages as a celebration of the ancient Iranian holiday. Through six months of participant observation and interviews with the producers, artists, and critics of Eldfesten in Stockholm, I present a case where in multicultural policies and the programs that they support not only have not served as that cultural straitjacket, I argue, but actually have enabled and even encouraged precisely the opposite. These experiences of cultural innovation through collaboration with state intermediaries demonstrate that rather than throwing ethnic festivals out uh, and those multicultural policies that support them out with the proverbial bathwater, we must attend to immigrants' own experiences and understandings of them. In a planning meeting two weeks before Stockholm's 2012 Eldfesten, an impassioned debate erupted that divided the 20 or so volunteer organizers in the room. The event had faced a particularly rough week of community criticism, with local radio hosts and callers accusing the organizers of having stolen Iranian culture, Farhang Dozdi, mm -hmm. having committed cultural manipulation, Tahrifa Farhang, and having sold out in order to pocket Swedish tax dollars. After all, Eldfest in the year before had included performances by rappers, Latin singers, Swedish fire throwers, and all this alongside Iranian musicians and dancers. These features, they argued, should not appear in an Iranian event. And particularly troubling to some, the event had been called Eldfest in Swedish media instead of Charge and Basri, its real name. But until this particular meeting, those accusations had largely remained in the realm of local radio and had mostly been expressed by first-generation elders in the community. They had not been the opinion of the largely first and 1.5-generation middle-aged organizers in the room. This changed when a university student, representing a large student organization comprised of mostly young, recent immigrants, raised concerns over the costumes of a scheduled dance group. He said, the navel is not supposed to be seen in actual Iranian dance. Neither men's nor women's. So if they dancers, if they're dancing, they should not have their navels visible. Because in the Uppsala culture night, a group of them who danced, well, these things get a little mixed up with Arab dance and other things. The meeting almost immediately got out of hand. Several individuals agreed with the student. One woman extended his argument to express concern over the appearance of de belly dancing on an Iranian stage, which had been part of a short dance medley in the 2011 festival. Others disagreed with the appearance of Arab dancing in particular. 
Meanwhile, those who were professionals in arts and cultural fields bristled loudly at the idea of dictating costume and artistic choices to an artist. A political activist and self-proclaimed intellectual argued that he and his comrades had left Iran precisely because of censorship, and he would not stand for it here either. Another individual attacked the student's words and those of his defenders as racist, specifically anti-Arab. The meeting leader quickly brought the meeting to order and returned the focus to the speaker's list and the issues on the agenda. But as soon as the meeting ended, the debate continued. The student re-articulated his original claim, and as we walked out of the meeting, he made a point of clarifying his position to me. He said, you cannot spend one million kroner and then use symbols that aren't part of your culture. And because Swedes are kind of hazy, gij, they, and they don't know a lot, I used hazy, I had, you know, don't know a lot about or recognize these cultures, they mix them up. For example, last year when a Latin American musician came to Eldfesten, still to this day, Iranians say to me, last year a singer came from Latin America, I still don't understand what that was. Okay, fine, but then an Arab or Indian dance or whatever can be just as strange to people because you're supposed to be working for Iranian culture. At the base of this student's criticism is an interpretation of culture that scholars have long critiqued, variously called essentialist or culturalist ideologies. In these, conceptualization, human, hum, in these conceptualizations, human beings are bearers of a culture, which is bounded, homogenous, and static. Their cultural traditions are not only seen as fixed and timeless, but also felt to be owned by some and in need of protection from others. In other words, culturalism assumes that cultural groups are made up of like individuals who are all different from everyone outside the group in ways that are essential to their identities and thus do not change over time. To the student in question, and to many immigrants like him, Iranian celebrations are owned by Iranians and thus reserved for specific linguistic and artistic traditions that encompass an authentic Iranian culture, also owned by Iranians. The student's culturalist perspective excluded Arab dance from Iranian culture despite the fact that Arabs form a minority group in Iran, and he illustrated his recognition of, Iran, of uh, Swedish audiences as either ill-informed or unwilling to make distinctions between cultural boundaries that he felt were really critical. As he told a woman in the meeting, Swedes don't understand, they mix it up. We're doing this to separate it for them. When anxieties like these were expressed in the Elfeston Committee meetings, they prompted conversations that required Iranians to debate the nature of inclusivity and integration in a diverse society through the frames of authenticity, tradition, practice, and representation in diaspora. Through Elfeston, I make two arguments about the impacts of this festival specifically, but also the potential impacts of cultural policy on immigrants and their incorporation or integration more broadly. First, Cultural policies can operate in unexpected ways that create opportunities for the spread of democratic practices and cultural experimentation within and across diaspora groups. I found that culturalist understandings like that of the student I just mentioned and of community members who had claimed cultural betrayal were debated among Iranians in Stockholm precisely because Swedish cultural policies offered an incentivized discourse of in intercultural exchange and integration. Thus, I argue, cultural policies can have important impacts on immigrant incorporation, but we must also study what happens off stage in order to recognize them. Iranian Swedish producer Mansur Hosseini works at the National Touring Theater of Sweden, an organization responsible for carrying out much of Sweden's cultural policy priorities. In 2009, the Swedish parliament passed a new government bill on cultural policy. One of the key elements of this policy was articulated by the Swedish Arts Council, Kulturrådet. And they said, it's to promote international and intercultural exchange and cooperation in the, in the cultural sphere. And within it, the acknowledgement that intercultural exchange, like international exchange, is extremely important for the development of cultural life. This shift to interculturalism and away from multiculturalism has been a strategy in other policy contexts in Europe as well even though interculturalism has been as difficult to define as multiculturalism. Some scholars have argued there's no substantive difference between the two, but others have argued that unlike multiculturalism, interculturalism more explicitly encourages a two-way process of immigrant incorporation, or what is often called integration, as opposed to traditional forms of forced assimilation. This results in a shift in identity for both immigrants and non-immigrants. In terms of cultural policy, for example, this might be interpreted to mean that not only should Iranians appear on Swedish theater stages, they should be cast as Swedes, not just as the foreigner, the immigrant, or the outcast. When I spoke with Hosseini about the significance of the National Touring Theater's role in organizing Eldfesten, he highlighted to me the connection between cultural policy and an intercultural understanding of integration, 
when he described the need for state cultural organs, like the touring theater, to reach out to immigrant communities. He said, integration is really important. But integration is not just you should speak this country's language. You should speak Swedish, and you should eat meatballs, and buy IKEA, and you're Swedish, and now you're integrated. <laughs> no. Integration is not that I involve myself in your culture. It's that all cultures should be involved together. This intercultural emphasis of Swedish cultural policy and Hosseini's position within the National Touring Theater, a Swedish cultural institution beholden to the winds of Swedish cultural policy, certainly influenced this view. Through intermediaries like the theater and its employees like Hosseini, cultural policies determined at the state level have enabled unexpected outcomes among immigrant communities, and in the case of Eldfesten, the larger Iranian diaspora as well. In 2010, a small group of young Iranian organizers approached Iranian colleagues employed in established Swedish organizations whom they knew prioritized cooperation, inclusion, and democracy, people like Hosseini. Such aims for inclusivity are common to these organizations and echo those found in Swedish cultural policy. This, of course, was not coincidental. These themes of inclusion, diversity, openness, and democracy were repeated throughout my interviews with the various organizers and community representatives responsible for organizing Eldfesten in 2012. Indeed, the original vision of the founders was to bring the event to the center of the capital, out of the suburbs, not only to broaden the audience, but to demonstrate the capabilities of the Iranian community to work together in a professional production in collaboration with Swedish organizations. Thus, the organizers worked to recruit any and all local Iranian associations in Stockholm interested in collaboration. The result was the Eldfesten Committee, whose membership included local Persian language schools, radio stations, and other ethnic associations. The committee has remained open to new membership without exception, and all of its meetings are considered public. Termed a co-production, the members of the committee met weekly or bi-weekly during several months of festival planning and were responsible for weighing in on the festival's cultural matters, like artist selection and representation of Iranian traditions. But they were also tasked with organizational aspects of the event, such as certain logistics, publicity, and recruitment of volunteers. For, for this association, this was an opportunity to work on a mutually beneficial event with fellow Iranians. But for the state intermediaries, it was an effort to engage community members and to demonstrate and rehearse democratic processes. As Hosseini told me, if I want to make a show, it's my job every day. It's what we do. We produce theater here, and I've done it for 27 years. It's nothing strange for me. But the good thing to do is to involve civil society. Of course, I could choose the artists, and it would have been much easier. But to just discuss with the committee, to respect them. You know, democracy is not something you just bring overnight. Democracy should be built up. I think it's important just to listen to each other, and culture is the best way to rehearse democracy. Each committee meeting was presided over by Masoud Mafon, an Iranian-Swedish employee of ABF, the Workers' Educational Association, a large Swedish organization that works to support labor movements and liberal adult education. Mafon's tall build, deep voice, and humble yet authoritative approach were among the many tools in his arsenal for keeping the order among a very diverse group of association representatives and community leaders. That he insisted on a democratic process to these meetings, including open debates, speaking lists, timekeeping, and voting systems, was not a coincidence. His experiences in ABF and his political views on democracy all traveled with him to the Eldfesten meetings. He told me, in these years in Sweden, I learned how to behave, how to act. Because if you don't become democratic in one night, it's a way of life. Democracy is not something where you fly here from Tehran on a plane and one night become democratic because the country is democratic. You have to learn. You have to learn the process and show how you can collaborate. It's possible that in Iran we spoke about democracy, but we didn't live with democracy. The experience of speaking democracy and doing it differ, so we teach. Because Iranians don't have experience, we didn't have a democracy, and these are democratic processes that we must practice. These democratic rehearsals took place in Eldfest and planning meetings each week, where I observed heated community contestations surrounding issues of tradition, modernity, democracy, culture, and assimilation. In the face of a public celebration of Iranian New Year that welcomed Latin bands and rappers and Swedish fire throwers to share the stage with Iranian classical musicians and dancers, criticism from the community was abundant. It included accusations of tarnishing cultural authenticity, contestations over ownership and rights to represent an Iranian holiday in such a way, and debates over who should speak and spend on behalf of the community. The Swedish National Touring Theater provides roughly 85% of the funding for this festival including all production costs and management. Professional Cultural Association Farhang, the logo was up a minute ago, and other Iranian sponsors provide just the remaining 15%. This funding reality is directly related to the festival's multicultural policy-friendly features. Both funding organizations are supported in whole or part by state funds, and therefore the festival is as well. 
Indeed, Eldfesten could not exist without careful attention to the goals and imperatives of, Swedish, of Sweden's national cultural policy and its institutional, institutional intermediaries. As I noted earlier, interculturalism represented the dominant discourse through which Swedish cultural policies were implemented in 2012. Thus, counter to the argument put forward by anti-essentialists that rests on state demands for culturalist or essentialized representations. In the case of Eldfesten, by asserting notions of Iranian culture as bounded, timeless, authentic, or owned, Iranian Swedes nearly prevented their communities from staking claims for state funding and support, not the other way around. In debates among Iranian Swedes about Eldfesten, there's an anxiety about the need to protect and preserve cultural traditions in the face of assimilation pressures. The feeling by some Iranian Swedes that a kind of authentic Iranian culture exists and should be preserved despite immigration, assimilation, and everyday diasporic life also reveals this anxiety. In the case of Eldfesten, this position was productively debated with self-described intercultural ones, thanks in part to the influence of Swedish cultural policies and Iranian Swedes who disagreed with culturalist interpretations. Using the term practice to indicate more than just behavior then, the leaders of Eldfesten argued that culture is the realm where Iranians should rehearse the skills of democratic life, absent back home, and yet critical to a future they envision for Iran. To conclude, the context of these rehearsals, committee meetings, radio programs, interpersonal conversations, reveal the ways in which democratic ideas and practices rehearsed in meetings supported by the state <clears throat> uh, traveled beyond the debate room. These are unexpected outcomes of cultural policy developed through unexpected mechanisms. Thus, in the case of Iranians in Stockholm, we find state-supported cultural production promoting immigrant participation, which is a key integration goal of the state, but not through the celebration of identity or through identity politics, but rather through diasporic practice. Thanks. Thank you so much to Dr. Khafipur and Dr. Brand for the invitation. I'm really flattered to be in the company of the scholars whose work is so foundational in Iranian and diaspora studies. Uh, I'm going to cover a lot of ground in this very short talk, uh, some theoretical and a lot that's empirical. And I promise that I'll somehow stay within my time limit, uh, and perhaps I'll be able to elaborate where I wasn't able to during Q&A or in conversations we can all share after the panel. Soraya. 17 years old and perched on the edge of a chair in her childhood bedroom, holds out a school photograph of herself at age 12. In it, she's scrawny, all elbows and braces with a tangle of inky black hair. I didn't like myself, she says. I thought I was ugly. This is a predominantly white area, and kids would say, wow, you have a unibrow. You have really bushy eyebrows. You're so hairy, you're a gorilla. And I would be like, okay, dude, I know, it's obvious. Thanks for the reminder. Society kept reminding me. I told my parents, the kids in my class are making fun of me. They're calling me gorilla, making ooh-ooh noises. They say bin Laden is my dad. And my mom said such a typical Iranian parent thing. She goes, Soraya Junam, just tell them we are the original white people. <laughs> we are Aryans, you know. Iran comes from the word Aryan. I knew the kids bullying me would laugh if I said, I'm white, you guys, so I just kept quiet after that. For Iranian Americans, there is perhaps nothing special, interesting, or very unique about this story. Although Soraya's experience as an elementary school student was soaked in the red alert fury of the early 2000s, the long fetch of history reveals that racialized sentiment toward Iranians in American cultural life predates today's war on terror or yesterday's hostage crisis by more than a century. The paradox is how exactly Iranian Americans, a group defined as white by law since their earliest arrival in the United States in the 19th century, encounter patterns of prejudice consistent with those of racial minorities while remaining categorically white in the eyes of the state. As Soraya's testimony suggests, visible or perceived markers of physical difference in other words, matters of race, are a meaningful mechanism through which Iranian Americans are identified as racial others. Yet, 
the everyday racial stories of an estimated 2 million Iranians living in America have been continually forgotten, ignored, or brushed aside due to their incompatibility with the sociological, legal, and specifically American construction of Iranians as a white racial group. Now, as a critical mass of second-generation youth come of age, it is time to critically assess the racial status of Iranian Americans. In my discipline of sociology, we know a great deal about groups who have become white. For example, we know how immigrants from Ireland were paid in wages of whiteness, how Italians were made white on arrival, and how European Jews became white folks. So in other words, we know a lot about how people who were considered brown a hundred years ago have now come to be called white. So this then begs the question, can today's white groups ever become brown? If we're seeking to answer that question within the racial landscape of the contemporary U.S., I would argue that it's groups from the broad Middle East and North Africa who have from their arrival been legally situated inside whiteness who are increasingly as a class and at politically exigent times escorted, framed, or pushed out of its boundaries. To advance the Iranian case, I'll share some ethnographic evidence from my book under contract with Stanford University Press, The Limits of Whiteness, Iranian Americans and the Everyday Politics of Race. The book follows a cohort of 80 second generation youth through a variety of institutional spaces. The hidden histories of race in their immigrant family homes, their variable integration and exclusion in schools and neighborhoods, the gendered racialization of their securitized travel to and from Iran, and the making of an Iranian racial family at a diasporic summer camp. Taken together, the chapters of the book provide strong evidence for what I term as the paradoxical racial position of Iranian Americans as, quote, legally white, but extra legally brown. And as Soraya's story demonstrates, school operates as the first major institutional site of racialization that provides real-time feedback to second-generation youth about the limits that exist to their particular shade of whiteness. But before Soraya or youth like her have ever even entered American schools, they've lived at home with their parents. Thus, it's crucial to unpack the racial self-identifications that transnational subjects like Soraya's mother bring to their new homes in the U.S. What Soraya describes as a, quote, typical Iranian parent thing, her mother's matter-of-fact declaration of not only a white racial identity, but an inalienable Aryanness, will perhaps not surprise the people in this room. You know, either from your own familiarity with this issue or from ongoing academic debates about the relationship of Persian as a language to notions of race and ethnicity, that the nation-building projects of the 19th and early 20th centuries did much to concretize these ideas in Iran. But this revelation, that some Iranians believe they are the world's original white people, always shocks the sociology audiences with whom I speak. They're surprised to learn that people like Soraya's grandparents, as the first generational cohort to be mass-schooled in rapidly modernizing Iran, would learn and pass down narratives of white racial identity. And while its veracity is still debated in Iranian studies, it is this very notion that Iranians are the original white people, with its complicated, troubling, and sometimes quietly whispered history within our diaspora, that 12-year-old Soraya understood would make her bullies laugh. And though I don't want to belabor this short talk with tons and tons of sociological theory, it's important for me to say that this disconnect between what youth are told is their race by parents, by authority figures, by federal forums, and what they experience as race is precisely what makes the Iranian case interesting to sociologists. Scholars of assimilation would predict that since Iranian Americans are on the whole financially well off, live in majority white neighborhoods, and possess high levels of education, their children's political and social incorporation into the American mainstream should be fairly smooth. But as I'll show, out through, as I'll show throughout my talk, simply living near white people does not make one more white in the microsphere. And in fact, for youth like Soraya, physical proximity to whiteness in the U.S. is actually what produces the social ostracizing and exclusion she experiences in her childhood. Alternatively, scholars of what is known as racial formation theory understand race as a master category that's inextricably connected to the state, and it's made up of racial projects that situate bodies and identities in relations of systems of power and domination. 
Some projects like segregation or exclusionary immigration policy exist at the macro scale. Others like stereotyping and prejudice exist at the micro. The macro side of racial formation theory remains the more fully developed of the two, and sociologists taking up a macro level analysis have uncovered in detail how hegemonic statecraft and global imperialism produce race. From a macro level perspective then, Soraya's mother is entirely correct when she advises her daughter to simply assert her own whiteness. According to hegemonic ideologies in the sending country and a white legal ID in the receiving country, Iranian Americans like Soraya are white. But it is the more often neglected micro side of racial formation theory, in which race is also produced by, quote, everyday experiences that sheds helpful light on the racializing function of the bullying Soraya experiences, likened at once to a large primate, a gorilla, and to North America's terrorist enemy number one, Osama bin Laden, Soraya's macro-level white ID is in fact undermined and upended by extra-legal, micro-interactional assignations of race. So in short, second-generation Iranian Americas are really an ideal test case for the limits of whiteness for three reasons. One, the first-generation immigrant Iranians tend to enter the U.S. with deeply held cultural beliefs that they are not only white, but also the world's original white people. Within the United States, at all federal and state levels of government, Iranian Americans are legally codified as white, and they have been since long before they arrived to U.S. shores. And three, following their largest migration wave after the revolution, Iranian Americans entered the U.S. with and have maintained disproportionately high degrees of economic and human capital, and all of the other things that would flow from that. So. In short, they're an ideal test case, and in fact, a focus on Iranians within the larger pan-geographic Middle Eastern identity category is also ideal for this analysis, because it's precisely this class-privileged, education-privileged group that sociologists would expect to integrate into mainstream whiteness most easily. So, together, if predominant theories of racial formation theory and assimilation are correct, these three factors should predict a relatively straightforward fit into the white racial category for Iranians in the U.S. But as described in Soraya's story, Iranian American youth tend to grow up in households that have strong cultural and familial ties to Iran, but actually possess very complicated racial self-IDs. Talk of race is even further complicated once these youth enter primary school, where the historical narratives that undergird Iranian claims to an Aryan whiteness are lost in translation. As the first major socializing agent the second generation youth encounter outside their own families, schools in the U.S., as you know, require children and parents to fill out a battery of instruments application forms, aptitude tests that reinforce a racial schema in which all persons, quote, with origins in the Middle East must self-ID as white. But at the same time, these schools are the first place where Iranian youth face vehement and sometimes violent challenges to their state-defined whiteness through persistent race-based bullying by school-aged peers and even authority figures. Neither their legal white designation nor the inoculating theoretical effects of assimilation guard these youth from longstanding mores that tie, quote, real American identities to European American bodies. Scattered across majority white suburbs, much like the total population of Iranians in the U.S., my research participants spoke very plainly about the extent to which they have been marked as racial others against white counterparts in their neighborhood primary and secondary schools. Here, I focus on several representative cases from my fieldwork in which the limits of Iranian whiteness are made clear through evidence of three everyday micro-level racial projects. Through the case of Nazanin, I describe how categorical lumping sets Iranians and other Middle Easterners apart from whites. Through the case of Amir, I describe how adapted derogatory slurs further the racialization of Iranians from white to brown. And finally, through the case of Sima, I describe how ad hoc bodily distinctions demarcate the limits of whiteness and how Iranians become firmly placed outside its boundaries in micro interaction. I met 18 year old Nazanin in her hometown 20 miles outside Boston. We started with hot chocolate in a Starbucks built to look like a shabby chic barn before walking around the town square. While we walked, Nazanin confided that she was the, quote, weirdo among her friends in primary school, who hailed from generations of proudly Irish and Italian-American families in New England. 
She says that it took several years of exposure to her family, their food ways, Persian language, and her parents' accents for her friends to feel, quote, comfortable going over to her house after school as frequently as she would go to theirs. She remembers the early teasing of her friends as good-natured and mostly based on unfamiliarity. You know, ew, your food smells weird, that kind of stuff. Shallow stuff that it's like once they ate my mom's food, they were like, oh, never mind, this is tasty. She told me that September 11, 2001 was a major breaking point in the way she was perceived by her classmates. Whereas her friends' good-natured teasing had not bothered her, by grade three, she had begun experiencing harassment and bullying exclusively focused on a perceived connection she had to, ter to terrorism. People were really racist after 9-11. Before 9-11, I was the Persian cat, the Persian princess, not just among my friends, but in my whole town. But after 9-11, I got some of it. At my school, which is mostly Italian and Irish, bullying was especially directed to the Lebanese kids and to me. I look Middle Eastern. I look like the images they show on TV. Friends and strangers would say to me, shut up, terrorist. They would make comments about Muslims that were really hard to hear. They did it to, like, socially intimidate me. They would make snide comments when I'd defend myself. I'd be winning, but they would just completely shut the fight down with a comment, like, oh, go bomb somewhere. And then they walk away, like it's okay, and like they've won. And it's unfair, because what are you supposed to say to that? You can't be like, oh, excuse me, I'm Iranian. I'm not the Saudi Arabian bomber you think I am. To them, it's the same thing. I was shunned by some of the white people at my school after that. Despite her rich and early friendships with white peers in her neighborhood, Nazanin has not occupied a racially neutral status, either before or after September 11. Known first throughout the heavily Irish and Italian neighborhood as the weirdo, or alternatively as a Persian cat or princess, Nazanin was a social other well before September 11. Her family's food, language, and other cultural practices were, as a matter of course, always gauged against an assumed local norm by peers. And by this measure, there has been an ethnic specificity to Nazanin's social incorporation since first entering primary school. But following 9-11, the tenor of this reception moves from ethnic specificity to categorical lumping, based on a newly emergent racial grouping. Ascribed with the identity of a, quote, Saudi Arabian bomber, and bullied for this alongside her Lebanese peers, Nazanin's liminal whiteness takes a micro-interactionally non-white turn. Culturally and phenotypically ID'd as Middle Eastern, the Iranian Nazanin, her Lebanese peers, and the imaginary specter of a Saudi Arabian bomber are categorically lumped into a freshly stigmatized group that's based on their perceived racial similarity. They are here extra-legally and cognitively split out of whiteness as a group based on perceived racial difference. So in this way, micro-interactions and everyday experiences at school reveal new racial formations that would remain partially obscured if we were to only look at macro-level racial projects or to just socioeconomic status and spatial integration variables. Next, I describe Amir's case and the boundary-making power of adapted slurs. <coughs> Though I had initially met 18-year-old Amir in 2008 through some of his volunteer work at an Iranian-American organization, it was not until three years later that I found myself sitting across from him in a park on a quiet summer afternoon. It's kind of weird that I've never told anyone in the organization this story, he said, because it kind of says a lot about me. Preceding the 79 revolution, Amir's parents first moved to Canada, where he and his brothers were born in a multiracial neighborhood in London, Ontario. Five years later, Amir and his brothers moved to the States with their parents, bouncing around until they settled in what <clears throat> he called a rural town, grade seven, and I'll call it Woodward, located outside a Midwestern state capital. It was here in Amir's incredibly homogenous new setting, a 96% white school, that he first learned through micro-interaction how profoundly different his new American peers found him. They called him the best-known derogatory slur against blacks with the word sand in front of it, or sometimes they would not even modify the slur at all. Quote, my anger issues were getting really bad, he told me, because I was constantly ready to throw down for a fight. Then the thing with my brother happened. It was the day after Bush declared war with Iraq. 
At this point, Amir trailed off, and he wrapped his knuckles against the picnic bench, before describing this following story, which I reproduce here in original form, with the caution that it includes disturbing expletives and slurs. Shahram, Amir's older brother, was entering his senior year of high school when the family had moved to Woodward. Not knowing anybody at his new school, Shahram felt fortunate that two students he had met in the commons area, one second generation Pakistani American, another Ghanaian, had seemed amenable to letting him sit with them. While sitting with his potential new friends, Shahram looked up from his lunch tray, surprised to find 20 or so varsity football players surrounding the table where he was sitting. First, two began yelling at him. Sand nigger, camel jockey, you America-hating motherfucker, fucking terrorist scum. Then another student knocked his books and lunch off the table. Not knowing what to do, Shahram sat silently while the rest of the standing boys egged on their teammates and chanted, fight, fight, fight. A school resource officer intervened and dispersed the crowd before the altercation could advance any further. Here, Amir interjected his own retelling of the story with a clarification about Shahram. You need to know, my brother, he isn't like me. He's not a knucklehead, no anger issues. He's a gentle guy. He's a really intelligent guy. He just says to the officer, I want to report this to the school administration. I just got harassed because of my race. This isn't supposed to happen. As requested, the school resource officer took Shahram to see the assistant principal in charge of discipline at Woodward, Mrs. Murphy. After listening to what happened, Mrs. Murphy, and here, many years later, Amir still gets frustrated recounting the events. She writes up Shahram for detention, cautioning him that many of his classmates were concerned for the safety of their family members and friends serving in the military, and that perhaps he should be more sensitive about how his Iranianness could trigger strong emotions at his new school. It wasn't until several days later that Shahram realized although he had been sent to detention, none of the football players had been or would be punished for their actions. Admittedly, I was deeply disturbed by Amir's story, and even more so when I returned home from our interview and located a report in the town's newspaper in which Mrs. Murphy, the assistant principal, confirms this exact account of the incident and its aftermath, explaining that she tried to, quote, make Shahram aware of how emotional President Bush's announcement of an impending war with Iraq was at Woodward High. There was also an ironic coda noted in the news article. The bullying of Shahram took place during Woodward's participation in National Safe Schools Week, an event meant to inspire more inclusive and less violent campus climates. But while Safe Schools Week addresses peer-to-peer -peer aggression, in this case it's actually an adult authority figure who most severely sanctions the victim by sending him to detention, tacitly suggesting to Shahram and others, like his Pakistani and Ghanaian American classmates, that they should not seek support from the administration in future cases of harassment. Deploying slurs and threatening bodily violence are apparently understandable and excusable offenses at Woodward. Shahram is the one who makes a punishable mistake of being visibly Iranian. By simply existing at Woodward High, he has provoked his classmates into a hate crime. Amir says that what happened to Shahram was a watershed moment in his own development. From that point forward, he understood that, quote, my kind of white isn't the same as their white. You know, teachers, vice principals, they don't look out for minority kids. It made me bitter and angry. When Amir says, my kind of white isn't the same as their white, it's crucial to reconsider the micro-interactional role that slurs play in boundary making around whiteness. In my sample, a strong majority of young men and women report having been called an adapted racial slur in school. Such slurs contain long, well-known legacy that tie them to macro-level racial projects like slavery and colonialism. But like the categorical lumping and splitting that Nandanin's case revealed, these adapted slurs do more racially formative micro-interactional work as well. They push Iranian identities and boundaries, excuse me, identities Iranian identities and bodies outside the bounds of whiteness. And as in the final case of Sima will show, the role of the body remains especially salient in everyday experiences of racial formation. If you drive about 30 minutes into the Washington, D.C. Beltway, you would reach Sima's house in an exclusive suburb I'll call Brickvale. As Sima describes it, Quote, it's a political city, D.C., and so everything in the schools I've gone to, the sports teams, the classes you take, the teacher wrecks, it's all pretty political. 
Admits a town that caters to diplomats and wealthy expatriate families, Seema's parents enrolled her in a French immersion primary school. She recalls that the first few months were difficult as she had grown up only speaking Persian at home and the adjustment to communicating with new people in two unfamiliar languages, French and English, was jarring. Even in these early days of primary school, Seema had the distinct feeling that, quote, being Iranian isn't cool in the same way her new schoolmates proudly discussed their Irish or French family backgrounds. One of her parents' most enduring stories about Seema's childhood were her plaintive questions about her looks after she started attending the school. Why couldn't she have red hair, freckles, and green eyes like her best friend Margaret? Would she always have olive skin and eyebrows that stretched into a single thick line over big inky black eyes? Despite her parents' best attempts to get Seema to view her dark futures as beautiful and unique in Brigfail, she felt plagued and alienated by them. In particular, her anxieties about having dark features and a unibrow were grounded in direct and memorable experiences of bullying in school, as this unibrow became the subject of teasing and treated as a mark of her foreignness and racial difference. One incident from primary school sticks out in particular for her. As she progressed through grades four and five, her feelings of insecurity about her, quote, uncool Iranian heritage and dark physical features had begun to recede as she learned that she could survive the taunting. She had even won some fellow students over, befriending them and hanging out with them after school. She knew she had made it when her friend's reactions to hearing her speak to her parents in Persian went from, what are you saying, your language is so weird, to, wow, you speak so fast, can you teach me some bad words? Seema even decided to run for president of her primary school in grade five, something she would have never dreamed of doing before that. She worked for weeks preparing her speech and outlining a campaign agenda based on an anti-bullying platform where older students at the school would mentor and support younger students. She remembers being nervous on election day, trying to keep a quiver from her voice as she rose in front of her class and delivered a speech that she had rehearsed many times over in the mirror. As she recounted this story to me in her brightly decorated bedroom six years later in grade 11, I could still detect the sense of accomplishment this achievement represented for her. For Seema, the achievement was not in winning an election, she ultimately would not win, but in choosing to render herself visible and legible in front of her class. With her dark skin, curly hair, eyebrows and all, her sense of accomplishment came simply for running for office in the first place. Yet I was surprised to hear why she was really telling me this story. I'm never going to forget this, she said. In the brief moments following her speech, as she was reeling with adrenaline and nerves, a boy named Tommy stood up at his desk to ask her a question. In front of the entire class, he said, so if you win, are you going to make us say the Pledge of Allegiance like this, while taking his right hand from his heart and putting his index finger across his eyebrow? He was making fun of my unibrow, she remembered. An electric feeling and scattered giggles scourged through the classroom, with all eyes on Seema to see how she would react. No friends stood to defend her, nor did the teacher interject with any sort of admonition to Tommy. Seema describes her reaction as going into, quote, fight mode, like she was floating above the classroom and watching herself react. She recalls turning her whole body toward Tommy and feigning a strong, enthusiastic tone of voice. Okay, Tommy, sure, if you want. You want one of these? Like, we can do this for you if you really want. Seema doesn't remember what happened next. All she remembers is that she didn't win the election, and Tommy moved away to Australia shortly thereafter. Since he had often targeted her for bullying, she was relieved to see him go. Yet, she was shocked and a little scared to encounter him back in Brickvale for their junior year at a large public high school. And he, she was especially shocked when he handed her what she describes as a, quote, five-paragraph essay detailing and apologizing for the myriad ways he had bullied her about her physical features in primary school. Though Seema accepted his apology. I was like, ah, ha, ha, don't worry about it, Tommy, it's okay, ha, ha, ha. But both Seema and Tommy can recall with great detail the bodily-based bullying that continued to knit them together even after he had moved halfway across the world speaks to the power of micro-interaction as a socializing force for both individuals, if not also for their peers in the classroom who were silent witnesses to it. 
Honing in on physical appearance and doing so in a public setting in front of an audience, this is foundational to micro-interactional processes of racial formation. Youth like Soraya and Sima, Amir and Nozanin are not only identified in ways in which they look different from an assumed norm, but they are identified as such in politically charged space. We see this very clearly in the example in the grade five election, where Tommy suggests that should Sima win, she would force her classmates to pledge allegiance, not to the American flag, but to some foreign loyalty indicated by her unibrow. These interactions draw on the ugly but pervasive perception that certain bodies and identities are unfit to hold elected office. Unibrows, body skin, or excuse me, body hair, skin tone, and other embodied markers of difference are central to the social reception of Iranian youth in school. And in fact, these interactions around legible embodied markers of perceived racial difference were the most common way that youth in my sample were othered by peers. Recalling Soraya's story introduced at the beginning of this talk, in which her unibrow is set in constellation with Osama bin Laden and a gorilla. These markers of bodily difference do not function as an intra-group ethnic distinction that is between Iranians and other whites. Instead, they're catch-all racialized markers that are used to cast particular bodies and identities outside whiteness and to narrow the racial category's scope to re-articulate its limits and boundaries. In this way, bodies and the fine grade differences between them, well beyond skin tone, are irreducibly part of the racial lingua franca of everyday experience. It is how and why Soraya knows that her type of white would make her bullies laugh. Within the field of sociology, the Iranian American case presents an opportunity for the field to refine and update its most foundational theories surrounding race, ethnicity, and immigration. Without attention to this micro level, we would miss the dog whistle or boundary making capacities of everyday processes like categorical lumping, the uses of adapted slurs, and the making of bodily distinctions. These racial projects can be subtle or overt, hidden or in full view, but in their symbolic power, they're dependably consistent in outlining the limits of whiteness for Iranian youth in America. Thank you. I want to basically what I'd uh, like to do is to kind of tell you about uh, the data sources that are out there on Iranians and uh, that are all other groups. Can I just say, can, every, can everyone can hear? Can you hear me? Because we've got it, we have the detachable mic. Yeah, right, yeah. This is better. Okay, great. And here I thought that was loud enough. I guess. So how's the Iranians? Right. Uh, it, it, it locks. That's probably yeah. the it's not working. Wow, now I'm restricted again. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's fine. I'll, I'll, I'll just I'll just stand on this side. Okay, no problem. Right. So the uh, thank you so much. Well, I first of all, I, I, that brings me to, uh, uh, to my attention that I should uh, thank uh, Professor Laurie Brandt, uh, distinguished director of the Middle East Studies program here, uh, very esteemed uh, scholar in Middle East Studies, and Professor Hani Hafnipur, and also Hani, actually, because, and also Camilla Chopani, who's not here, who's done a tremendous amount of work. I'm organizing a conference myself this week as I return, a uh, two-day conference, and I know how much work this is. It's going to be even worse for me now than here. I've got to get the ground running when I return. Okay, so this is uh, 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 what I'd like to do is to uh, talk to you about uh, data sources that are available that virtually everybody here can use because they're all online, not like in the old days when I started this, uh, uh, where I had to go to the basement of URL. He knows this very well at UCLA. And uh, look at microfish, you know, uh, you know, to dig up some of these data. Uh, the, the, at that time, it was called the Immigration Naturalization Service, INS, 
Now it is a much more foreboding term, Department of Homeland, Homeland Security, or as we call it in the least studies, the least American studies call it Department of Homeland Insecurity. And they, they, they published uh, this uh, yearbook of immigration stats. And uh, what this does is that it gives you the annual number of immigrants and non-immigrants. I'll talk about those differences in a second. Entering the, entering the US by country of origin, like Iran you know, and other countries. Okay, These, there are detailed data available there on age, gender, occupation, marital status. Okay, and also you have a separate uh, sort of data series on refugee and asylum admissions, which are very important for groups like exile groups like Iranians. And, uh, and these numbers can be compiled to show trends over time, which I'm going to do right now. So this is a sort of a, a, a basic graph that tells you about Iranian immigration to the US uh, from 1964, where really data were first became available on this population to the most up-to-date data that's available 2013. And um, now there's something really puzzling when you look at this data, because you see the peak is here, right? And this year is roughly 1989, right? But for those people in this room, any of you Iranians or scholar of Iran, know that that really doesn't correspond to the huge influx of Iranians in the US. Right, I see a lot of head shakes. That was the late 70s, 1978, 79, when the revolution happened, right? So we'd expect to see this peak right here, and we don't see that. And I'll tell you in a second why that is the case. Uh, but what is uh, important is to think about the Iranian Influx or immigration in terms of three path, three waves, right? One is the before before the revolution wave from 1950s, where we have data on them. Of course, they came before that, uh, but uh, really big influx in the, in the in somewhat of a sort of a bigger influx in the 60s, but a massive influx in the 70s when the students came uh, before the revolution. So that was mostly a student migration, right? Including some pioneers uh, who came for economic reasons, some for political reasons, and of course. The post-revolution, post-78-79, which is sort of the influx of the elite exiles, and over time, gradually, you get into Iran-Iraq war, you have the sort of uh, refugees coming from more humble backgrounds, and then, of course, the 2001 and post-9-11, which kind of really has become a watershed for the Middle Eastern and Muslim immigration in general in terms of uh, uh, the sort of blockages and in terms of the restrictions that are imposed on but I'll show you why that is the case. Okay, so first of all, let me, if you look at this data, let me backtrack again. If you look at this data, when you look at the 2000, 2001 here, right? So if you look at this, you think or see that the Iranian migration actually has increased, right? It sort of ebbs and flows, right? Fluctuates, but nevertheless, there's a, the, the pattern, the trend is upwards, right? From this, okay? But this is misleading because if you look at this data, a lot of people will say, well, then 9-11 is really not, doesn't have any, one, any sort of an effect. The problem with this is that this data, the data that I showed previously, which corresponds to total admissions, this number here, right, consists of two categories. Those who adjust their status and those who are new arrivals, okay? In other words, the first figure, the, the red, the red uh, graph, or the red bar, right, is essentially those who are coming as immigrants, green card holders. But there are two ways that you can be a green card holder. You can either come as a green card holder, right, or you can adjust your status to a green card holder. Like many of us here as previous students, right, we adjusted, you know, in my case, we, I, I adjusted embarrassingly too late. Okay, so, but, uh, and if you look at that, if you look at the new arrivals, this number is pretty flat. And you see a huge dip after 9-11, after right, after 2001. Okay, so the adjusters are the ones that are going up. So what is really interesting is that the, the big sort of increase in the total immigrant admitted is due to adjusters, not new arrivals. You follow that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, if the, the reason that now this figure actually corresponds to the social reality much more, to the historical context. And when you see the peak is where? 78, 70, 78, right? And these are non-immigrants. Non-immigrants is sort of a confusing category. I was trying to explain this to a film director once. He said, can you say that simply? I said, no, that's the category, non-immigrants. <laughs> non-immigrants are visitors, students, or people who come on business visas, right? They are not permanent immigrants. They are not LPRs, legal permanent immigrants. They are not green, green card holders. Non-immigrants, and then the revolution happened in Iran, the vast majority, there was such a sort of a panic that people wanted to leave, 
they came in whatever form they could. And the easiest way to do that was as visitors. Okay? So these are the ones that came. It was a huge, huge, and you see, of course, this is flattened out over time, right? And uh, what is important is that these non-immigrants subsequently became immigrants to a variety of reasons, right? Professional sort of preferences, to family reunification, or whatever that is. Okay, so and this is uh, this is what why it's important to look at this. Now, if you look at the refugee situation, this is a separate category. I didn't include the asylees because refugees and asylees are two separate categories themselves. Refugees are those who are granted refugee status from abroad. Asylees are those who come here and apply for asylum. Actually, a lot of Iranians did that because that they came in, you know, sort of a, as as uh, as non-immigrants and subsequently sought asylum here. But the refugee, sorry, the refugee category is very important. And you can see that over time there's a fluctuation with this, right? So during the you know Iran-Iraq uh, war, you have a big influx, uh, and again, you know, right around this time. But this is very very complicated. I've actually uh, sort of talked to interviewed people in Iran who have been waiting on sort of their, their green card for like over a decade. I mean, it's in, almost after 9/11, it's becoming impossible to come. But Iran is a major refugee sending country, and in fact, at some point, actually, was one of the had the highest asylum approval rates among asylum seekers in the U.S. Uh, so that is uh, why there is this, uh, you know, there is uh, the exiles and refugees being very prominent in Iran. Now, so that is one data set that actually you could use that talks about the immigration. The reason I showed that was to so and Tani might say, what well, what does that have to do with your talk? You know, so with the second generation is to suggest and show and actually the um, uh, uh, document that there has been a sort of a slowing down trend of the immigration from Iran, which means that it, it has allowed for the emergence of the native born children of immigrants and is becoming a much more sizable segment of the now, to turn to that uh, sort of a distinction, we need to look at the American Community Survey. American Community Survey is now has now replaced the census. The U.S. does not conduct census anymore. Uh, actually, when it does a census, it's uh, uh, it's every every ten years, which is very very brief. It's just a sort of a ten questions. You know, you see that ten ten questions, ten easy questions, right? That are distributed. Does it collect a lot of data? And uh, the reason for that is that you want to have more up to date data. So this is the American Community Survey that's on an annual basis with a sample of the population, 1% of the sample of the total household. And this, this stuff actually, I'll show you in a second, is readily accessible on American Fact Finder. This is something that you could kind of just play with. It's not really intuitive, but it's kind of fun. You know, so for instance, you can look at the population of Iranians in the US, you can look at it by, by state, so you can do sort of simple cross stats with nothing really fancy. And uh, what is important about the American Community Survey is that it contains the questions on ancestry. And this ancestry is really key in identifying Iranians, uh, since, as Nadal said, race does not really sort of help, and we'll come to that in a second. Now, these data are available for individual year, you know, like, for instance, 2013, but also are, are, can be merged, or are actually not, and are available as merged data for multi-year, like, for instance, five-year period. And this is very important to access the merged data because the merged data offer a much larger sample when you're dealing with relatively small populations like Iranians. Uh, this, uh, so then, and of course, they are downloadable and convertible into Excel, but you really need to run SPSS you know, data analysis uh, to sort of make sense of this data. This is what you could do with American Fact Finders. It's really easy and <coughs> it's fun. You can look at ancestry, right? And you can sort of <coughs> pick, the, pick put, say, put, say, put, put the ancestry tables up. Put Iranians in there and run things by geograph geographics, you know, race ethnic groups. Here, here you have the access to it right here, right? And then you can look at some other things, occupation, education, this and that. So this is the census question. Okay, this is the census the race question in the 2010 census. Okay, this is that short form that the census gives out. Before that it was a long form. Uh, and, uh, uh, and the long form allowed uh, sort of uh, more detailed questions on ancestry. But this is uh, the question on, on, the first question is a question on sort of uh, on Hispanic origin, right? Then the second question is a race question. And if you look at this, you know, you see that there is no place, you know, that Iranians sort of can list themselves, right? So the, the, this, the, this white is the category that they could use, or they could go to this category here. 
some other race, okay? And there was a, there's been a big push. I'm sure you living in Los Angeles know about this. Iranianscount.com, right? Iranian organizations, you know, like Paya have been spearheading that. And the idea was to get Iranians to fill this, to put this SOR, some other race, okay? And the purpose and the reason for that was to get a large number of SORs, right? Sounds like SOB, sorry. And <laughs> in here, and then these SOR, then go to the census and say, look, you know, we need a category on Middle Eastern and North Africans because the census is not picking them up. And lo and behold, how many do you think they, well, first of all, the census did not release this data before. There was a lot of pressure. Census really is very sensitive to community demands. We've been meeting with them since 1980s when we started the ancestry group and the ancestry question was first introduced. In fact, census is completing a meeting in late May, early June, which I'm attending, and to discuss about the possibility of the, uh, the pre-testing in, in Maine on Middle East and North African category for the 2020 census. So it's a very, very important and, and new sort of development and very exciting. Uh, and uh, the idea was to, but uh, due to the community pressures, organizational pressures, the census gave us the count, the total count of Iranians who put some other race. They, of course, made this available also for Arabs, for Turks, and for other groups. And how many do you think actually were there? You have an adventure, yes? You said there are two million Iranians in the US. Estimated. Yes. Estimated. Estimated by whom? <laughs> How many do you think? 300,000. About right. Yeah, 289. Not everybody did that. But 289. Right, of course. But the point is, I thought it's actually a tremendous number. I, when I talked to Pupaya people, they said, oh, wow, you're the first one, only one who thinks that. Everybody expected a million or something. <laughs> the numbers are not there. I'll show you that the numbers are not there. Okay, so, uh, so that argument really cannot be made on numerical. At least not on a specific group. The arguments have to yes. The census uh, has erroneous type of categorization here because Persians <coughs> also can go into the what? Asian category. The, the, the white category includes people, the census specification is that white includes people of European, Middle Eastern, and North Africa. Right, that's the wrong definition because Iran is in Asia. You go and fight the census. <laughs> <laughs> this is, this is the. Or they're counted as Asian. This, is, this goes back to the OMB definitions. They are very reluctant to change. Census insists on comparability of data for analysis over time. It's very tough to do it. And they're not required by law to do that. This is not a legally required ancestry. It's not a legally required question. Races, but ancestry is not. OK, so now, if you go to this, I, and so the Iranians basically say, well, you know, we cannot be counted. We are invisible. We are not there in the census, but they are. <laughs> And this is the question. The question is the ancestry question. If you look at this, actually, you see some categories that are listed, including Arabs, Lebanese, right? So here gives you a chance, gives everybody a chance, as filling two sort of uh, uh, blank spaces, two ancestries, right? And uh, we are using either the first or second ancestry to get at the Iranian population. Because you could say Iranian American, you could say American Iranian, right? Now, if you put here, Jewish Iranians, the Jewish, of course, gets lost because it's a religious category and census by law, a constitutional law, you are not supposed to require, the government is not supposed to collect data on religion, okay? So there is that. So now, you're looking, looking at the population size of Iranians, I'm looking at it over time, according to the census, okay? In nine, this is 1980 figure, and 1990 figure, 2000 figure, and 2011 figure, okay? These figures are very consistent, Okay, one could argue that the 1980 figure was a huge undercount, possibly, because it was right after the hostage crisis. Uh, you know, so there is a really problem with identifying or revealing your identity. But the numbers over time are very consistent, and this is the number about half a million Iranians. Okay, this is according to the census. And in fact, ironically, the 2012 number is slightly smaller than the than the 2011. So that's why I'm using that. I'm using comparable dates. You know, sort of the decennial dates, essentially. Okay. Now, where are the Iranians? Uh, this, is, this is a very simple rule of thumb that has uh, existed over time, right? Half of them are in California and half of them are in Greater Los Angeles. 
You suggest that the Iranians are not moving out. They have certificate even the second generation. You know, the children of immigrants, the native born, you know, right? It's a slight decline, a slight spreading out. I just talked to a great student, where is she, Mina? There she is, Mina. She said, I said, where are you applying to school? She said, Berkeley. Well, you'll figure. I said, yeah, any schools back east? I'm encouraging her to apply to an undergrad. She's, a, she's not. So the, and, uh, and that's, that's, that's sort of, a, and we'll talk about that later on if you're interested in this. But you see this stuff of populations there, right? So California, Maryland, Virginia, D.C., uh, and Texas, and New York. And in fact, in New York, you hardly see any Iranians. The only time I see Iranians is when I'm getting on a plane to come to Los Angeles. <laughs> <laughs> Right, so this is uh, uh, now this is the sort of the, the crux of the talk, and this is the population that you see the native-born population, the foreign-born population. Okay, native by native we mean U.S.-born, foreign mean Iran or elsewhere, right? Uh, but, you know, most of them are Iran-born. Now two-thirds of the population are foreign-born, right? And the majority of the foreign-born came before 2000, understandably before 9/11, right after the revolution. Foreign-borns are older than native-born, obviously. Okay, this is a real sort of an interesting issue. The second generation, so median age is 17, so they're still very young. And some of these things that we're talking about that we have to be very tentative about because of the age is really, really young. But what is important is that 36%, over one third of the population, now is native-born, and that's a sizable segment. And increasingly, is going to figure more prominently because immigration from Iran is not very high, and therefore, natural increase is going to be the determinant of population growth. Now, so this is kind of an interesting uh, 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 figure here that I'm talking about, uh, and I think it sort of shows some pretty remarkable sh sort of uh, shifts. Uh, what the, the first of all is the education, education level, right? But for the population BA or higher, the level of education Iranians are so high that you don't need to look at high school grads. You've got to look at the top, the higher echelons of the education level. And what is really important about this figure is this disaggregating the data into by gender. And here you see something really phenomenal. Look at this: the, the foreign-born males, right, and uh, foreign-born uh, uh, females, right? Okay, big drop. And look at the reversal here. <laughs> So this is a pretty incredible, in, within one generation, the female, the second generation females have not only caught up with, the, with, the, with, the, with their uh, 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 mothers, but they've also exceeded them. Now, of course, you know, this is still early, and I think we expect them to even go higher. This is, by the way, consistent with big, big surveys like Rupin's uh, project on Los Angeles and uh, my colleague's project on New York that shows the, the daughters of, of immigrants are doing better than the sons. And it's a very, very complicated story. Actually, generally, even in the US, maybe the overall pattern, too, but for sure, very prominent among immigrants. Now, if you look at this, the comparison would be the total US population. And you look at the Iran-US ratio is about two, twice as high for males and about almost twice as high for, for females. Okay, So it's quite high to begin with, actually, for females. right? very high compared to the US population, but then of course it's astronomically high, right? So if it, this, this is for all Iranians, but if you look at the females uh, compared to the US, it's almost you know, three times, right? It's much higher than that. Now, if you uh, look at this, yeah, and so I'm, I'm sort of like highlighting these differences here, okay? Now, this is kind of an interesting uh, table. And actually, the table that really surprised me myself, you know, in the first place. And the idea was, that we keep hearing about the Iranians being doctors, uh, the, the, the dentists, lawyers, and engineers. And in fact, that's really not the case. Look at the percentages. Percentage of the foreign born that are in these occupations. These are supposed to be occupational niches, right? And you expect a very, very heavy concentration. But the percentages are really not that high. And what is really interesting is that in some cases, of course, there is an increase for the native born. We expect more lawyers here. I was at a friend's uh, uh, outfit in Glendale. Both sons are lawyers, <laughs> and both work with them. And, uh, and we'll talk about that later on. And of course, it's sort of a, a, a slowing down of the engineers. The idea was that the first generation wanted to go back to Iran, right? Second generation don't have any plans to go. Don't have much plans to go. I to live there. I mean, to have transnationals they might visit, right? So, but these are not really the, the action is right here. The action is really in managerial and sales and related occupations. And the reason for that is that the the 
tremendous proclivity of Iranians towards self-employment, okay? particularly in the first generation and continuing in the second generation. So, and of course, in some jobs, you know, the sort of the healthcare and things like the service occupation, and you see some, some differences. So in sales and related, you see a decline. And as I show you in a second, you'll see decline in self-employment. The children of immigrants are not necessarily following in the footsteps of their parents, you know, in, 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 the, in entrepreneurial activities, um, and um, also a decline, some, some sort of decline. But this could be due to age, so we expect a much an increase in this over time. Teachers and professors, those who are here, you know, so as, uh, as somebody just said before the conference, we virtually every university there's some, some academic is not here. Okay, so, uh, yeah, so let's go to the next table, and this is the earnings, okay? These are the reporting median earnings, mean earnings are very susceptible to outliers, the very high and the very low. So we're reporting the median, which means half of the population is over this level and half is below. Right? So again, the foreign and native born differences uh, done again by gender, right? So you look at males, uh, native born, right? And the females, <laughs> you see the increase there, this is very, very interesting. And this is the total US population, okay? So this is the percentage there is in the labor force. So this is very important because what it's telling you is that more and more uh, Iranian females are entering the labor force. Okay, something that was really not necessarily as much the case in the it was not it was it was high but it was not as high okay and it's higher than the total US one and this is a really big big kind of an indicator when you're talking about populations like Iranians like Koreans right the percentage of self-employment is very high actually one of the highest uh, usually like after Koreans and Greeks the third you know or so the least and generally score very very high in self-employment about five of the top nine entrepreneurial groups are Middle Eastern, and uh, part of it because of the tradition of entrepreneurship in Iran, you know, in the Middle East, part of it is because of the capital that they brought, part of it is actually because of the preponderance of religious minorities, like Jews, Armenians, were very, very entrepreneurial in those countries. And, uh, and this is a very interesting decline, a drop that actually is also observed by uh, my colleagues who work on Koreans, okay? Children of uh, uh, self-employed immigrants are not necessarily following in their footstep, but if, if there is any possibility that they will do that, is what is called the self-employed professional route, you know, like doctors, dentists, lawyers, architects, right? Which we'll have to see over time. But the earnings is quite interesting because the earnings are already on parity. <laughs> I mean, this is pretty incredible considering the average age is so low, so we can project a, very, a much higher earning down the line, okay? And, uh, and of course, for females also, this, this is sort of, you have to be a bit more careful about this in terms of, you know, whether what the family does to them, motherhood and things like that, whether they will come out of the earning. These are, by the way, data are for population 2564 and for currently employed workers, okay? So, now, this, I, I sort of like uh, threw this in because I think it's quite interesting. I gave a talk at uh, the Iran Studies Seminar in Colombia, and I talked about all this stuff, and they were, they, they were interested. But every single question I got was about this. <laughs> okay, and in fact, that was, at that time, it wasn't as, as detailed as this. Okay, but it wasn't a distinction between the foreign born and native born. Iranians are preoccupied with language uh, maintenance. That's, uh, as you here would, uh, would testify. So the idea here is that the, the, this is kind of an interesting, I call this, I call this a paradox. This is with a paper that a student of mine was now at Berkeley. I worked with uh, and, uh, and it's coming on the International Journal of uh, Sociology of Language. And it's really fascinating because you have very, very high level of English proficiency among the, among the foreign born, right? Look, over about 80%, but well, you expect the native born to be highly proficient. Right? That's the minimum expectation that Iranian parents will have of their kids. Right? But with the foreign born, this is very, very high. But look at this. This is quite interesting. This is the language spoken at home, mainly spoken at home, right? And it sort of puts all these categories together because every one of them applies to Persian, right? And about 30%, 33% of the children of immigrants, native born, speak Persian at home. This may not seem like a lot to you, but it's higher than Koreans. <laughs> It's higher than Filipinos. It's higher than many other groups. And that is really, really remarkable for a population that has such English proficiency to also have such a high level of the degree 
of Persian maintenance. And the reasons for that are numerous. One, obviously, is the exile, you know, the status that I made this written about so extensively, uh, the connection, to, and also the transnationalism, the connection to the homeland, the language schools, you know, Mina is very interested in taking Persian. You know, she really wants to do that, so I hooked them up with the Persian professor we have here. And uh, also the, the maintenance of Persian at home, of course, the you know, sort of significance and importance of Persian literature and Persian poetry, and, uh, and uh, you know, the uh, uh, Persian programs that are available. So it's really sort of the, uh, even back east, the study that we did is a small scale sort of a, a field work, you know, back east, uh, and uh, even there in these areas where they're not highly concentrated, uh, you still have this uh, uh, version. So uh, it's kind of interesting then, you know, at least on this indicator of assimilation, we really, I'm not really presenting a lot such as the marriage and things like that. The most important ones in the marriage. But it's, and if you look at the concentration in California, if you look at sort of the occupational specializations, if you look at the maintenance of Persian, generally it seems like the second generation are not assimilating anywhere as fast as people expected you know, for a population that is very highly educated, is essentially categorized, officially categorized as white, uh, lives often you know, sort of in affluent neighborhoods, and, uh, and can, uh, can fan out and assimilate and, uh, this person. Thank you very much. Uh, the gentleman uh, in the corner. Uh, thank you very much. All, all three of you presented outstanding uh, information. Uh, if I may take a two minutes short, sure. uh, I ask my question to Amy Malek. Uh, I got used to it quite often this kind of a meeting, and this is the first time I hear from her when I came to USC. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, from now on, I'll go more. <laughs> if you speak, I'll be there, for sure. Wonderful. That's part of it. My question is uh, maybe sensitive matter, but is it, uh, when I ask someone uh, different, white, different color than white, and I'm from Korea, so I ask them, where are you from, to make a friend, you know? And they say, I'm from Persia. I said, Persia, there's no country, Persia at this time. And it came three, four times, and finally, what do you mean by Persia? That oh, it's Iran, you know. I said, oh, okay, now I understand, you know. <laughs> but uh, my question is, uh, uh, when they answer, they should say, to my opinion, is uh, I'm Iranian, you know. And then the at the tone and attitude contact is uh, I'm Iranian. I'm peace loving man, <laughs> peace loving people. I'm intelligent. I, I'm very religious. And all the good things. So they should show that kind of image on their tone, their attitude, their smile, you know? So... The religious is the kiss of death. You know what I'm <laughs> so, so that's what I'm wondering. Um, it's my personal opinion. Shouldn't they say, I'm Iranian proudly say, I'm here to make a friend with you, you know? What do you say? <laughs> Me? Yeah. yeah. Um, it's a good question. I mean, as our panelists will attest, this kind of... Uh, uh, use of Persian was often, you know, a, a way of kind of um, combating discrimination and reactions during the hostage crisis and in, in times where Iran was in the media every evening as a, as a, um, <coughs> the enemy, the enemy of the U.S. And so uh, as a coping strategy in some cases, people would say Persian. In other cases, I've, I've heard um, young people who defend their use of Persian say, well, it's my ethnic identity. I'm, I'm describing my ethnicity when I say it. Fine. Me personally, I've always said Iranian just because I am uh, Iranian and American, and so it's a lot easier for me to just say Iranian American. My mother's American. I get away with you know, not having to really distinguish um, ethnic identity and really just use the national term. Me personally, I hope that Iranians are able to say I'm proud and I'm Iranian, but I certainly wouldn't make the decision for anyone. It's a personal choice to identify as, as one might choose. But if that's I may nice. add one more thing, is uh, there is a nobody like uh, Lori Brand in USA. 
and I envision you as a future glory uh, <laughs> in UCLA. <laughs> I would be very honored to be in such a position. <laughs> I'm going to hire you as my cheerleader from now on. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Thank you. May I just make a quick comment about this? Please my go ahead. cousin, who is uh, uh, blonde and blue eyed, when he uh, was asked, where are you from, he would say Luxembourg. <laughs> and they said, uh, oh, amazing, we've never met anybody from Luxembourg. And he would say, good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Professor Nafisi, please. Yes, this is to, uh, to uh, Neda, but perhaps others. Uh, just following up on that question, uh, the, uh, I think the arrival of Shaws of Sunset <laughs> uh, is in a way the coming out of Iranians uh, as, uh, as as white, but by calling themselves Persian, mm -hmm. I think that's that's where their whiteness I think comes from, mm -hmm. and then their association with money, with luxury, with uh, in American dreams, all of the stuff that uh, they seem to show. Up. Can you talk a little bit about the, the role of that show in whitening in your own? Yeah, thank you for that. Um, I think that though we laugh about it a lot, it is now the touch point. It is like sort of the biggest. Um, popular cultural artifact right now that as um, Iranian people we're asked to sort of talk about or it's, it's becoming like a mainstream reference point at this point so I think it behooves us right to have some sort of feeling toward it um, I have to say I find uh, the kinds of discussions that they've spurred for my non-Iranian friends to actually pivot more around Shahs as a way that we can think of Iranians as not white it's actually more about sort of um, uh, these moments on the show that are very interesting where this uh, they'll be using subtitles because the um, cast is speaking in Farsi and Persian um, and they're sort of saying like we're not white they're distinguishing themselves for example um, there's a scene where Reza is like at a store and he's looking at this rack of bikinis and there's a rack that has these bikinis that are like gingham like the little plaid you know from like hee haw or Americana right <laughs> like uh, Beverly Hillbillies um, and he says like that's so ugly that's for Sefids we would never be caught dead wearing that, right? Um, and so there's this constant sort of reference point about Sefid people, Sefid culture, Amri Kaya, this, that, whatever, right? Um, and so uh, Shaz is kind of funny because it um, establishes a sort of like Persian supremacy that I think that we need to unpack, but I wouldn't say that it maps onto what we call white supremacy quite exactly. Yeah. Uh, please, go ahead. This is, I guess, this is a question for um, Amy and uh, uh, Neda, um, but I think that you might want to chime in from your experience as well. Um, I was uh, really interested in um, your sort of embrace of the hybridity of these cultural festivals, that um, it there shouldn't be some sort of mutually exclusive uh, a defin or some definition of culture is a static thing where um, the navel shouldn't be shown because that's Arabic. Versus, and this sort of mixing of the cultures should be, um, should be encouraged because it's productive and, it, and uh, uh, in many ways. I, I took that as that you were sympathetic to that argument. I, I'm or, more presenting the argument, and um, I view it as an inevitability rather right. than as some Positive like uh, normative sense that this is how it should be done or shouldn't be done. That, right. I'm not trying to present my take. I'm trying to present their takes. Yeah. Okay. So that, so you're n neutral. Um, then m then that sort of idea that this is an inevitability. Then uh, how, how doesn't that become dangerous when we have the kind of categorical lumping? that you witness, right? Because if if these festivals are to sort of um, promote integration or this cultural exchange, this two-way cultural exchange, shouldn't those distinctions, and not, not in terms of authenticity, but in terms of historical accuracy, right? Mm -hmm. Shouldn't they be preserved so that the Saudi Arabian bomber is not uh, <coughs> confused with the Iranian kid in, in the suburb? Or 
or should we actually just try and work with that and, and work with the fact that these two identities and histories are constantly being conflated anyway? So how, how do you work around that? Could you repeat that question? Well, from what a summary of the question, I suppose, is like uh, if the, the, the festivals that I'm looking at, uh, if the people are who are org organizing them are looking at this as an intercultural opportunity and not looking at it as a, a, a threat to preservation of a particular kind of Iranianness as authentic, mm -hmm. then are, is there a danger then that we are not distinguishing ourselves from those who are terrorists or something like this? Yeah. From the perspective of the dominant culture, right? From the perspective of the dominant culture. Right. Good, yeah. Um, I kind of bristle at the, the um, claims that Iranians often make that, no, but those are Arabs who are terrorists. Mm -hmm. As if it's okay to then say, like, oh, you should be discriminating against Arabs and Arab Americans, mm -hmm. right? Um, it's, uh, it's a dangerous thing, particularly when we are lumped, but it is also... Um, something that uh, I think in our communities often kind of feeds on an anti-Arab and an Arab racism that has existed among Iranians. Mm -hmm. um, so I think among the, the groups that I was looking at, their concern, particularly in Sweden, where um, they don't say Persian, really. They really do say Iranian much more. And they are absolutely lumped in with immigrants. Right? So immigrants are racialized as other far more than just Arab or African, or where you're from is almost uh, not as important. Um, so for them, it's much more about um, being open to all of the other immigrant groups and kind of solidarity with other immigrant groups, and, and then also working with Swedish institutions to say, like, look, you need to like, really think about the population. 20% of your population is immigrant, so you need to consider all of us as being part of your national image. Um, and so the, the distinction of Iranian versus other Iranians, they don't particular, or non-Iranians, they don't particularly like. Whether it feeds into this, I don't know, I think it would be interesting to hear your take. Yeah, I think um, both if we sort of look in the diasporic context, but also if we were to just look at the everyday cultures of young people living in Iran right now, whether they're our cousins or, you know, um, just as somebody that we don't even know, I think were we to go into their lives, we would not see this sort of... Um, fossil that was buried in amber sort of version of Iranian culture that they're all living. Um, this is something that's living and it's breathing and it has influences that are geographic, both these sort of porous boundaries of Afghanistan, of uh, the Arab world, you know, so I think like today's Persian culture um, is not what we in the diaspora sort of are talking about when we get obsessed with like an ethnic festival like this. Um, and so if in fact in Iran uh, they're allowing Persian culture to be something that's living and breathing and changing and it's been influenced, and frankly, if we look at the long fetch of history, we know this, right? The influence of the Arab world and other places as well. So um, I think that we should also be accommodating enough in our lives in the diaspora to allow for that kind of organic and porous growth as well, too. So, yeah. good question, though. Thank you. Please, you go ahead. Um, my question is for Neta, but all of your talks were just really interesting. Um, what I was wondering, so. I mean, I have to say the, the three people that you were talking about, their accounts, they really resonated with me. And one of the things I was wondering is, and it's, maybe it's kind of a general question, I mean, these accounts are from students when they're really little, they're in grade school. And I'm kind of, and, and so that's a very kind of a specific context, and it's this certain period in your life, kids tend to be pretty mean, and they do whatever. So I'm wondering, um, in your other research with Adults. Like uh, how, I guess how unique is that to that time period, um, you know, if you can just speak to that. Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, so this talk focused on uh, the sort of early childhood experiences, that moment where the kid leaves the family nest and enters this sort of first major American institution. Um, but throughout the book, I'm really trying to track these sort of racializing experiences as not just um, happening in these early stages, but there's something um, that the young people both carry with them as a kind of psychic burden that was begun as a child, but also that just accrues 
in different ways as they grow up, right? And so um, by the time, for example, the young people in my sample go to university, um, because of these sorts of experiences, they're already very keyed into joining, for example, like student of color organizations once they go to university, taking ethnic studies courses, um, really embracing what assimilation scholars would be surprised to see, right? That they sort of are, um, for example, like at the UC, coming together with other groups that we call MENA, Middle Eastern, North African, to create the new SWANA category, right? So that in the UC application now, Iranians don't need to check the white box. If they did that, that would actually be factually incorrect on the form. They now have a SWANA box, right, for Southwest Asian and North African. And so um, those are all these sort of grassroots efforts that Iranian-American youth <laughs> themselves have been at the forefront of. And so um, it's really hard in qualitative work to be able to sort of point to these specific things and say, this is the cause and this is the effect, right, and to draw those lines. But um, <clears throat> sort of, I can just offer like one example that I've never said in public before, but it's something that I think about all the time, which is um, I happened to be two winters ago at Sundance, which is this big film festival in Park City, Utah, and I was at an event um, before a film screening where they um, had a bar and people were mingling, and I saw a young man, and you know the thing where you see someone and you're like, I think they're Iruni, right? And so this person caught my eye, and I'm married, I'm not wearing my ring, so don't think that I was like trying to scope out this guy at a bar, but I just saw him and I thought, oh, you might be Iranian. So um, I kind of had an ear out as an ethnographer, um, trying to see what he was doing at Sundance, and I heard him approach a woman at the bar, making small talk, just getting to know her, and he was playing a game with her. He said, look, um, uh, do you know where I'm from? And she said, oh, I have no idea. And he was like, well, I'm going to list for you three countries. And the country that's different than the other two, that's where I'm from. And he said, so there's Iran, there's Saudi Arabia, and there's the UAE. I'm from the one that's not like the others. And this girl was like, I don't know what you're talking about. I was like, what? Um, and so again, like he's somebody who's already graduated university. He's just mingling a young professional at Sundance, trying to draw on this idea of like a Persian difference, a kind of Persian authenticity, right? But again, it's that categorical lumping. And it's not as violent or as hurtful as the example that I shared from Nazanin, but it's the same thing happening in this wildly different context. Context, right? So that's just, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Chapman. Please, go ahead. Just as a follow up, um, I wondered if you had any examples of like people who you know you talked about proximity to whiteness being sort of uh, know, knowing that that was the other and that that was white and that you were not. Mm. And I wondered if you had any examples where people had a strong proximity to other Iranians actually as sort of the majority group, and that whether or not sort of that story that you just gave that these narratives that came through the families and so on about the Aryan myth, and that if that sort of created some second generation members who, who bought into it, and that um, if there was like sort of if a proximity to Iranianness may offset that proximity to whiteness. Uh -huh. Yeah, um, I think that's a great question. Uh, again, because this relative number of Iranians is quite low, like Dr. Bozogmer did outline for us, um, I think even in the um, most tight enclave, like let's say growing up in Beverly Hills and you go to BHS and like, you know, you really have like a entirely Iranian crew of friends and family and cousins and da 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 da, you're still like living in the US. You're still interacting with the forms, right? You're still interacting um, out in society. There's the media, the TV is on at your house, right? And even if you're watching Persian Satellite, you're not doing that 24-7. And so um, in my sample, again, it's qualitative and ethnographic work, but there really was no difference in that like the young people in Orange County were somewhat inoculated from this versus the kid growing up in Oklahoma. Right? These were sort of like common patterns no matter where you grew up. Yes, gentleman in the corner. Yes, my question is to Amy. Uh, I don't know about the Sweden government, but uh, I was wondering if the government is following certain policies uh, in regard to uh, assimilation and intercultural to slow down the process. Because I'm sure in the United States is the, is the case. Uh, actually, the government tries to slow down this process uh, and not get all these uh, foreigners immediately uh, you mean immigration citizens, process? Yes, uh, citizens, yeah. because they say, well, they, they're going to come and vote and screw up our <laughs> system. So, so 
So is that the case in Sweden as well? Um, good question. So in Sweden, um, there is currently a shift to the right happening, which I saw, you know, I, I mentioned this one party is a, maybe an example of that, but in general, the center has moved to the right um, compared, you know, relative to the historic very far leftness of, of the government in Sweden over the last uh, century. But um, there are debates about whether that should be done, yet they continue to um, welcome mostly uh, refugees. So asylum seekers from Syria and the Syrian war, they have accepted a large number, and they continue to open their borders to that um, group in particular. So there hasn't been a shift in terms of, uh, they, there hasn't been a lot of labor migration for a long time, but there is um, uh, still a sense that we should be keeping our borders open for those who are fleeing war and other tragedy. So not yet. We'll see how the politics play out. Uh, yes. Hi. Uh, thank you so much. This was a great panel. I really enjoyed them. Uh, my question is for Netta. Um, I was really struck by the anecdote about Albergarian. Um, and I think, you know, for me, whenever I hear that word, I you know, go to <laughs> Nazi Germany. Um, and I was just kind of wondering what, there seems to be like this kind of spectrum of whiteness where you know, maybe the context really matters for what you kind of assert that kind of whiteness. <laughs> um, and if there's ever kind of a, a moment where in defense of uh, kind of a white categorization or in a way to kind of reflect the racialization that's happening, the violent racialization that's happening to the youth, the kind of taking on the, oh, I'm Aryan, swings Iranian whiteness into the, into the place of white supremacy. And I think it sort of speaks to the kind of certain kind of anti arab racism and anti-black racism that happens in the Iranian state. So maybe, I don't know if you want to kind of, that's a very unwieldy question, but maybe yeah. Maybe yeah, I think um, you hit the nail on the head with why um, why this is a very fraught thing and why um, we have colleagues in history who have really sort of taken up unpacking what's called the Aryan myth in Iranian history um, and trying to sort of go through the documents um, that did sort of concretize that as part of the national myth and um, it ends up I think um, derailing Q&A a lot of times at like history conferences and things like that because um, this is really like kind of still somewhat of a taboo subject to try to unpack. Um, from my vantage point, both as a person in diaspora who was born here and also being in sociology, um, I, I have not had to face that kind of blowback because I think I'm just kind of working with what the young people are giving me in this data, right? So um, you're sort of dead on to identify the historical antecedents for all of this, right, as something that did happen um, in particular with, uh, in concert with Nazi Germany, relationships with the Shah and Hitler, um, things that were really built on a kind of anti-Arab sort of Semitic uh, idea of what makes certain groups in the Middle East different from other groups. Um, and so uh, that is certainly the backdrop for all of this. Uh, and it makes like even less sense to use that Aryan terminology in the U.S. when you take that into account as well. So um, there's a chapter on my book about that. <laughs> but um, I didn't have time to really get into it here. Yes. Uh, so my question, I think um, all of the speakers kind of slightly touched on the issue, so any of you willing to answer, I'd appreciate it. Um, like you mentioned, there is uh, a growing number of Iranian Americans, um, most of whom are educated, they believe that um, where most white privileged uh, people live as well, and they have like, you know, a good job and everything, but I think there's a disconnect between that and um, how active they are as, as citizens of uh, the United States. I mean, we talk about democracy all the time, but what does it really mean to be a citizen um, in a democratic country? Um, and I, I'm wondering if there, if you see hope, uh, if you see a room for change in the future, if you are hopeful, and if so, how can we go about it um, to, you know, really learn? Uh, uh, <coughs> integrate our community by learning about our, what our civic duties are, what, uh, what we, how we can be impactful on um, US policies, maybe especially foreign policies, um, and, and all of that, what, whatever falls under being um, a citizen here. 
Yeah, I mean, good question. Uh, the Iranians, uh, there's a sort of a paradox, you know, very highly educated group uh, on the one hand, but extremely individualistic and not very collectivistic, um, very low organizational uh, sort of um, participation, uh, particularly in terms of advocacy groups, very high in terms of, say, professional organization, cultural organizations, and uh, and also, the, like many uh, Middle Eastern groups and Muslim groups, sort of really strapped for resources because of this dual uh, sort of mission of the Middle East, foreign policy, and also domestic policy. And in fact, what is really interesting is how groups like the uh, National Iranian American Council get completely derailed from the, it's supposed to be National Iranian American Council, but it's all about Iran, right? It's all about the new deal and this and that. So, uh, and uh, from what I hear in Washington is that Iranians are woefully absent at the table in political incorporation discussions from, you know, Arab American Institute and groups like that. And uh, we were, the hope was that the second generation would enter the fray, but I don't see it on a very big level. And, uh, and I think that, uh, uh, that is really, really going to be a problem. And one of the key problems that I've noticed is that Iranians just don't want to face up the reality. Like we've been talking about discrimination, prejudice, you know, I mean, all of this is couched within that racism discussion. And every time I give a talk somewhere and I even broach the issue, they say, no, 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 please don't talk about that. You know, let's just talk about how successful we are, how you know, how we made it, you know, how we are, you know, we are, we are, we are the most educated immigrant group ever set foot on this land, you know, and even if the data don't show it, but you know, the, that sort of the, that is really a problem. I mean, I think that I see Arabs, Muslims, much, much more effectively in tackling this issue. In fact, if you look at our backlash group, I document that, you know, and it's just not uh, not very active. And the problem with this sort of uh, even dealing with Iran is that you get labeled as, you know, the Jasus and spy, and then, you know, that's the kiss of death. It's really, really tough to, to go anywhere with it. There is a, um, um, a Paya collects some interesting data on the professional association of, uh, of uh, American, uh, professional alliance of American Iran. Uh, and uh, they, uh, do uh, uh, have some data on political incorporation. I know a student at George Mason University who's doing dissertation on this topic. And there's some sort of, uh, shows some level of participation, but it's really not, considering that we are in the post 9 11 world, considering that is the Iran US you know, dilemma, considering all of these things happening, I mean, I think that the level of activity is really, really. Professor Can we make a comment on? No, of course. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Um, yeah, I just uh, wanted to perhaps part ways slightly with Dr. Bozorg Mayer um, with the kind of pessimism he talked about regarding the second generation. Um, I was about three weeks ago at the White House to celebrate No Ruse with Michelle Obama. That happened because of a second generation staffer that works at the White House with her, right? And so that's about getting our biggest holiday on the table. That room was entirely full of second generation people who work at the Brookings Institute, who are on staff right now for different congressmen, right? Who have really incredible appointments, which happen after you've gone to university, after you sort of left the family nest, you've left the Iranian American on and you made inroads. And also, kind of piggybacking on the conversation about the SWANA category and what a successful political move that was at the UC to break Iranians and others out of the box, I think some of the political organizing the second generation people are doing is a bit more radical than even the group that was at the White House, right, who's working for Brookings, who's working for the Obamas. And so we have to kind of both um, expand what we call political participation to include those more radical efforts, but to also give it a little bit more time and let it breathe a bit, because because um, these young people are only in their early 20s and they're already getting things happening like Noru's, which last year was celebrated for the first time in basically portables behind the White House. And within one year, we were in the entire east wing of the White House with the First Lady there. And so in the course of two years to get Noru's sort of that far on the calendar um, is a really big deal. And that's a second generation effort. I would just add a 
quick international piece. So outside of the U.S., we don't see nearly as low of this political participation. So it, even though the Toronto community, for example, is relatively younger than, say, the L.A. Uh, community, um, yet its numbers are growing in very quick. Um, uh, it's about to overtake L.A. in terms of the largest number of Iranians in a given place. They have uh, members of parliament. They have um, members of the community, first generation, running for political office. They have uh, their volunteers who go knock door to door are Iranian immigrants. So even though the second generation there hasn't yet come of age, uh, and we see um, uh, much more recent immigrants in Toronto, we see much more political participation. So there's something also to do with the form of government, I think, and the ways in which the American system has um, maybe marginalized immigrant voices. Yeah. Oh, I, I, if I could just add on to that, because Amy, you reminded me that when I said last year Nowruz was celebrated at White House for the first time, but it was behind the building in a sort of temporary permanent portable, that actually only happened because of a staffer who is an African-American Muslim staffer who thought, like, we should be having Nowruz here. I'm not Iranian. I don't know Iranian people, but we should have a first Nowruz. And so that comes from these sorts of... Um, it's like the good side of categorical lumping, right? <laughs> that, um, that created that opportunity, and then you have a second generation Iranian American who's on staff with Michelle this year and gets it into the actual White House. But it's ultimately a cultural elective. Yes, exactly. There's still that. <laughs> yes, there's cult political political no cultural rules. But cultural activities yeah. create environments where political talk happens, where political connections are made, and so I hesitate to say that it was just about the half scene, and we were there eating kebab, and we didn't talk politics. You you know that that was actually a very political event in some ways. Uh, we in have. Your study, uh, uh, do you see a conflict between the first generation and the second generation? I haven't really done the, the, a lot of work on the intergenerational thing and a small scale study I did here, uh, interviewing about 40 students. Uh, we didn't see any much of a conflict. Uh, surprisingly, even along educational and career choices. Uh, so it was, uh, there seemed to be quite a bit of congruity because people talk about this, uh, you know, the sociologists talk about dissonant acculturation, you know, like how sort of the kids and parents have very, very different ideas about, uh, about schooling, you know, adversarial culture that you see in some of the second generation. They really didn't notice that. I mean, I think that. Uh, but I would be very interested to hear what you have to say about this, because I think that's no, the you know, I believe, uh, what I believe was, I was raised to believe, I lived in a country that I believed uh, my son, our sons, we have three sons, uh, they, they are raised and live and work in a different society, so they, they look at things differently, um, politically. You know, I have a little minor problem with right. my own son. My son did, did that uh, artwork over there. I see. You know, he's, he's, he thinks of one way where he should have gone. I, I believe I've worked in the system and I'm more and more convinced that was by far better than what we have. You know, I don't want to get into politics, right. but there is that um, religion played how we were raised and how he's raised. So I just just thought about the, the little argument right there. You know, uh, she thinks of one way, and then you know, she thinks of all about care, and you know. Uh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's the conflict. I'm going to have to suspend the the, the, the sort of democratic practice that uh, Amy <laughs> talked about in her, uh, her presentation this morning, because we really do need to get over for uh, the luncheon. But I would encourage you, yes. you, can, you can walk leisurely, please engage with the panelists as you head over to lunch. Uh, we will have about, um, I mean, there, we, we do have to go through registration at lunch because lunch was completely booked, so that may take a few minutes for people to get to your, to your tables. But you still have about an hour for lunch before uh, Max and Ian will come, so there's, there's plenty of time for talking. And uh, thank you all. I think thank you our panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.